only use these three manifestation techniques for good. Why do I say that? Because some people have used these in negative ways. Not me, okay? Maybe, okay, I'll share with you a little bit of example of maybe how I use this, but not in a very detrimental bad way, but these are in a way hacks to our reality that allow you to manifest or to create your dream reality faster than ever. And I wanna share with you what those three techniques are, how you can apply them, and how they will radically change your life. One of these techniques, there's a movie. If you've seen this movie, like this video or comment below, but it's called Catch Me If You Can. Have you seen the movie Catch Me If You Can? It's a movie with Leonardo DiCaprio, and it's based on a true story. It's kind of crazy. Based on a true story of somebody that what they did is they realized that they could, in a way, act as if, and they would be some new identity. So it was like it's kind of like a con man, to be honest, in the movie. But this guy was able to pretend to be an airline pilot, and he became an airline pilot. He was able to pretend to be a lawyer, and then be a lawyer. And he actually ended up, it's based on a true story. Wow, this is weird. I did a video, I was just looking at some old video footage that I had to delete from a SIM card so that I could like play, do this video. And I was deleting these videos from years ago where there was this fly in like four of my videos that was flying around me. And it would like land on my head and I would like joke around with the fly in the video. And I haven't had a fly in my video in so long, but it's finally here. I feel so non-codependent. Okay, there it is. But I'm happy that it's here, okay? So anyways, when it comes to this technique, basically, what it is, is it's like, it's realizing this three simple process. Are you guys ready for this? Be, do, have. Be, do, have. This is a manifestation technique that I've used that has completely transformed my own life. And remember this, you don't always get in life that which you want, because what you want, you lack. You say, I want that thing over there, and I don't have it, and I want it, which means I lack it. And when people want, a lot of times they stay in the want. For a long time, I wanted to be full-time on YouTube, but it wasn't until I moved into being a full-time YouTuber that my life began to change. So wanting doesn't get you what you want. Sometimes wanting leads to action, which then bridges the, the reality, but you always get in life a reflection of who you are being, who you are being. So that is what makes all the difference. So be, do, have. Now, in the movie Catch Me If You Can, what he did is he just started being these different identities. He is, is in a way a form of manipulation because he realized that if he could be different like a certain way and he would forge these checks and go into these banks and he would get like, you know, all this money and he, he was like a master at this con stuff. But it's based on a true story and it kind of shows you that you can pass off and be this ideal version of yourself. And as you believe it within yourself, other people will feel that off of you. Now that's why I say only use this for good. Now an example of this that I did back when I was a teenager is there was this mall in Las Vegas called Town Square, it's like an outdoor mall. And to get to the movie theaters, I go to a movie theaters with friends, you had to go all the way around this like structure in order to get there. And it would take like, you know, probably a three to five minute walk and we'd be like almost late for the movie. What I would do is I knew that employees went through this one door that went straight beelined to that of the, whatchamacallit, of the, the theater. So what I would do is I would go with friends and be like, watch guys, all we gotta do is open up this door and walk through, because there's, so, there's like H&M, there's like Gap, there's all these like retail stores that use this thing. I was like, I used to work in retail, so I know that you know a lot of times if you're working for these different stores, you're not gonna know who is what from what store. So what I did is we'd open up this door, we'd go through this employee like maze to get to that of the movie theater and we'd save ourselves like five minutes of time and people would walk by us and we would just say hi to them. We would just, in a way, be as if we were supposed to be there. And what would happen, see there's that fly, there it is. What would happen is just from being there uh, and being like that, people would just assume that we were supposed to be there. So in a light way, I mean, it wasn't, we were stealing anything, we weren't doing anything bad, but people feel, and I used to do this with friends too. I'd be like, watch, you can, I'm not saying you guys should go do this, by the way. I don't want to be a bad influence. You guys say, oh, I tried that, Aaron. And, uh, but you can like walk into, I would just sometimes test things and I'd walk into the back of like some store I didn't work at, walk into the back stock room for a second 
And just like if somebody would say something like, oh, hey, do you know where this person is? Or I would say, do you know where someone is? And I would say it with confidence. And I would be able to just do these things. And a lot of times people are just pre-consumed with themselves. So I get away with these weird things. Now, another way I use this is I used to work that nine to five job selling women's shoes at Nordstrom's. And when I learned about this book called Psycho Cybernetics, about how your self image controls what you're experiencing, I realized I saw myself as a mediocre employee and every day I'd go into work, I'd be in the middle of the list for the, the sales from the day before because they, they'd show all the other sales employees like, I don't know if they wanted competition or what, but we'd be able to see what we sold in comparison to everyone else every morning from the day before. I was always in the middle. And I thought to myself, how do I see myself? I see myself as an average employee. So then I said, what if I started being a top salesperson? I just gave myself permission to be it. I said, how would the full, the, the salesperson of Aaron, the, that is like the, the top salesperson, how would that version of Aaron act? B, greet people, look people in the eye. And I realized, oh, there's a, there's a gap between the version I was being to the version of the top salesperson. So I just started to be that version of me. Guess what happened? Within days, I was at the top of the list because I gave myself permission to be that version of me. So this stuff really works. I, did, I then did that with YouTube. I started, what does the version of Aaron that is full-time on YouTube do? He makes daily videos. And, he, and then I started studying different, like, you know, I started studying personal development. I have actually already been doing that. And I just started sharing and believing in what I was saying. So remember, be, do, have. You must first be the ideal reality version of you. Then you can naturally do that which that version of you does. And then you will have what that version of you has. Most people go about it backwards. They think I need to first off create art. I need to do that. Then I can have the art gallery studio and then I can be an artist. No, no, don't do that. Please just be it. Okay. Just be it. And then you will naturally get it. And there's actors, by the way, like Heath Ledger, who was in the movie, uh, he was the Joker in Batman. He said that when he was being the Joker, Guess what? There's that cruel little side. When he was being the Joker, he started to have horrible nightmares because he was being that version of him or being that, you know, character. And he was then resonating with that frequency and he was having weird dreams. He was having depressing thoughts. It's very interesting. There's many actors that have talked about this. And there's another actor too, old school actor. Was it Paul Newman? Was it Paul Newman? Yes, Paul Newman. It was a, a movie called Harvey, where he was this, he was this crazy guy that could see this life-size rabbit. It was a life, not life-size rabbit, like a human rabbit. And he played a crazy guy. He said out of all the movies he did, the most blissful character he ever played was this crazy guy because he didn't have to like, he was just so aloof and he was just so free. He said it was the most enjoyable role he ever had because when you are acting, you start to feel like that version of you, but realize your identity is a flexible little noodle. You say, no, I'm, I'm only meant to be a nine to five job gore. That's the real me. No, it's just the you you've been being, but you could change how you've been being just like I one day gave myself permission to be a nine to five job goer. And then the next day, guess what? I gave myself permission to be a YouTuber or first a top salesperson and then a YouTuber. Your identity is a flexible little noodle but it works be, do, have. You can be the ideal version of you right meow. Right meow. Right meow. Com like this video and comment below meow. M-E-O-W, meow. I'm gonna do this right meow, okay? And when you do this right meow, you will start to change your reality, but only use this for good, okay? You don't wanna become some type of like, I don't know, serial killer or something like that. That's not, what, that's not the, the goal of this video. The goal of this video is for you to become the most ideal version of you, which leads me into technique number two, which is also very powerful. I learned this technique from a book that should not be mentioned just because, uh, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to, eh. it's just a book that I learned this thing. Basically what it is, is, um, basically I'm not, I'm not mentioning that video because I'm not, if I say the words, then this video could get taken down. <laughs> So there's this, there's this book that I used to read and it has to do with uh, this thing. Like imagine the universe flowing through you. Now imagine that you have your own intention. You say, I want more money. I want to be in a loving relationship. That's what I want. Well, on the other side of that, there's somebody 
that wants to be in a relationship with you. So what is called, uh, so there's this thing called inner intention and outer intention. And outer intention is when you tap into the benefit of the universe, the benefit of other people. So when I make these videos, the reason it's easy for me to make these videos is because I get into a motherfucking flow state and then I just allow this to come through. And it just comes through and it hopefully adds value to you. Because it's not all about me and how I look, do I look perfect? It's, it's about adding value. It's like the universe comes to support me more. Now, I, some people call this channeling. Now, every one of you listening to this video are channelers in some way. When you are doing what you're passionate about, you're channeling. You're channeling like a higher vibrational energy. It is natural. It is easy. And what happens is that then energy, that pure energy benefits you and it benefits other people. So by me having the intention of adding value to you, it's almost like the universe comes to support me more. And because it's a more pure intention. Yes, there's an intention like, I hope this video gets like so many thousands of likes and people just like me and they comment nice things below. But behind that really desperate valid need for validation, you know what there is? There's just the intention of adding value. And guess what? The more value you put out, the more value you get back. Now, here's a weird way I did this. Back when I first learned this technique from the book that shall not be mentioned, I uh, learned it back in like 2017, 2018. And there was this house that I really wanted. I was like, I really want to live in this house. And there were eight other people that were like applying. I'm exaggerating. There's probably like four or five other people that applied for this house. And when they applied for this house, I was one of like four or five other people. And basically I tapped into the person that owns the house to rent it because the rental market was getting kind of crazy in Vegas. I tapped into their inner intention. What does this person want? They want some, a tenant that pays on time, that is clean, that, uh, I, um, that appreciates living in the house. So what I did is I wrote them a letter. I said, listen, listen, my name is Aaron. I own an online business. It's important for me to like where I live because I kind of work from home. I don't have pets. I don't have kids. I don't throw crazy parties. I really love your house. I love the way it's designed. I love the vibe. I love everything about it. If I live here, I will really appreciate the house. And I hope you pick me because I know there's like three or four other people. If, you exa if I exaggerate, there's eight other people, but there's that many people in that of whatever you call it, the, um, that, are, that are trying to apply. Well, I also, what I did is, this sounds kind of weird. I imagined that the house wanted me to live there. I imagined that the universe wanted me to live there. Because if I lived there, I could make really cool videos. And I'd be in a really high vibrational state. I'd be able to add value to more people. So I imagined that the house was like, Aaron, I want you to live here. Please bring your, your vibes here and live here. And I imagined that. And I'd go to bed at night and I would imagine that I was already living in that house. I'd imagine that when I was asleep, I was in the bed that was in the master bedroom and that over here was a door and over here was the bathroom and then there was like airplanes. I didn't know at the time when I was moving in that to be, it's so close to the airport that'd be so many airplanes going over it all the time. But guess what? I actually didn't, I didn't imagine that, but that ended up being the case. But anyways, I imagine that I could, I'm there now. I'm there right now. Where am I right now? Oh yeah, I'm in Austin, Texas. Okay. I've actually done the same thing with this house, which I ended up buying. But nonetheless, this is a very, very powerful technique that I've applied. Now, actually, I want to go back to the first one for a minute. Don't want to backtrack, but be, do, have. One of the things about that is to make it natural. When you're being this certain identity, if I was to like go through that back, that back stock room or something, when I was going to the theater, if I was like, oh, it'd be, it'd be tense and weird, right? It has to be natural for you. I realized what if it's natural for Aaron, a version of Aaron to make daily videos on YouTube? And then it's easy because it is natural. It's not on a pedestal. That was another thing that I wrote down on my handy dandy iPad that I forgot to share that I really wanted to share. Okay. So make it natural, make it natural. Okay. And when you make it natural, it's like you realize that by the time your identity has that, which you wanted to manifest, it is natural for you. Okay. I ain't trying to brag here, but I've created a lot of abundance over the last three, four years. And back three, four years ago, I would imagine where I'm at right now and I'd be like, oh my God, that'd be so amazing. What would I do with all that abundance? Now, guess what? It's just normal. I just got, I got, I got crypto investments. I got stock investments. I got house investments. I got all this stuff and it really don't. And honestly, guys, I know some of you, it's everyone says this and everyone wants to find out for themselves, but the money doesn't really make you more happy. It really doesn't. Um, what makes you happy is when you're doing what you love, when you go and when you're passionate about what you're doing. When I'm making this video right now, I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. Can you feel my energy? Can you feel it? Well, this is more excited for me than me like bathing in my pool of money. 
okay? Bathing in a bathtub full of like dollar bills and coins, okay? Which I do once a month. I'm just kidding, I don't do that. <laughs> That's weird. And I, yeah, I'm not that materialistic. <laughs> but um, anyways, here is the third thing, the third manifestation, manifestation secret, the third manifestation secret that will change your life if you apply it. Now, anybody, this is like almost like a template for reality. There's people in reality that have accomplished what you want to accomplish. And if you did this one thing, it would give you a template for how you could recreate it. So when I, what I started to do back in the day is I would read books from people that have already accomplished that, which I wanted. For example, Tony Robbins, he travels the world, speaks, does stuff like that. And I'm still on that path. Like not there yet, you know, but I would read these books and I would tap into his vibe. And I was like, how did he do this? Well, he had a, he had some type of like eighties ad where he was, it was like some eighties music. And then he was like, you know, um, talking about, you know, pretty much the same stuff he talks about now, <laughs> you know, about Bill Clinton and all this stuff that, you know, stuff that people he's talked to and stuff, but it's like an ad that like gets people to buy his book and uh, gets people to his events. So I could look at that and then he was making content, his version of content back then it was ads. Um, and he was, uh, like doing live events. I could look at what he was doing in his books and I could follow that same template, but I didn't. Why? Cause this ain't the eighties. So then what I did is I saw other people on YouTube that were successful and I thought, what, are, what are they doing? So this is what the third one is modeling, modeling, like not that modeling, but modeling, like modeling success. What has somebody else done? If you, there's a, a, a create a cool artist. What did that artist do to become successful? Well, they may have painted every day. They may have like reached out to different art gallery studios. Maybe they, uh, maybe they created their own. Maybe nowadays the modern version of that is maybe they created an Instagram account and then they learn how to like do certain things that get, you know, that get a certain amount of engagement and then they're able to market their art. You see what I mean? You can find people that have accomplished the success that you want to experience and then commit to it, commit to it. I committed and studied YouTube. What gets certain views? What kind of people like, do I go daily? Do I go weekly? Do I go once a month? Oh, the more I do, the more successful I'll become, the more feedback I'll get, the more natural I'll become on camera. So I modeled other YouTubers and saw their patterns, saw that they were good. I started making my own videos. I started getting better at it. And then I created that life for myself. So you can model success, model success. Tony Robbins talks a lot about this by the way, but in general, Find somebody that's already accomplished that, which you want to accomplish, and then decide that you are going to model that. And if you don't know what that is yet, start to ask the, start to have the intention to figure it out. And as you have that intention, you'll begin to see more and more evidence of that in your reality, but read their books, tap into their vibe. You know, I would watch, uh, seminars. I would read books. I would talk to people, you know, talk to people that were already doing it. And from that, I started to meet cool people. I met Sage Robbins, Tony Robbins wife. I met Jack Canfield when I worked at nine to five jobs on women's shoes, when I was starting to get my energy into this and synchronistically, then I went full time on YouTube. And then after being like, here's a cool little story. I met that of Jack Canfield and I told him when I worked at Barney's New York, something really cheesy. I said, oh my goodness, you're Jack Canfield. Cause I saw his black American express card. I said, guess what? guess what, Jack, one day I'm going to do what you do. I'm going to do what you do one day. And I said it like cheesy and he goes, Oh cool. Well, if you want to do what I do, here's a, here's my business card. And I still have the business card somewhere. It says I have a training thing. It's $20,000 for three days and it's in Scottsdale and you can do this training thing. And I could show you train the trainers. I could show you how to do what I do. I said, I don't have $20,000, but one day someone's going to put me on. That was what I believed. So one day I'm going to meet someone famous. Like, yeah, and someone's going to see the potential and put me on but he didn't put me on. He just said he paid, if I pay $20,000 that then I could go full time or, uh, you know, do what he does. Well, guess what happened? I then committed to the daily videos on YouTube. I then started to grow and then guess what happened? Like a year or two later, I, there's this place in Costa Rica, like a life transformation place. They, I've been there two or three times. I get invited there to go to Jack Canfield's mastermind. I was like picked to go to be around him and his crew. I don't know who, I don't know if he picked me or his team picked me or what, but because I'm in the same niche as them. So it kind of came full circle. It came for a circle. I'm now in 
influencer that could hang out with somebody like that because I've created myself to be that. But guess what? Nobody put me on. I modeled though, and I could have modeled, like what did he do? He uh, have, has books, chicken noodle soup books, uh, where he teaches people how to chick, you know, cook chicken noodle soup. Well, not really, it's just a, it's a compilation of people's stories for different like themes and stuff. And he didn't even write the books. He's the genius that put it all together. He curated it and then created this huge publishing company and now he's like multi, multi-millionaire. He's got a black American Express card. Millions. Okay. And, and uh, was in the movie The Secret, stuff like that, right? So um, somebody could model that. Somebody could do something similar. Now, I'm not doing that because I don't like to write. My passion is videos, but that is the idea. I'm going to share with you things that took me eight years to learn when it comes to manifestation, creating my dream reality, and things that may seem a little bit esoteric or advanced in a way, but nonetheless, once you learn it, you save so much time and energy from the old school ways of going about what people call the law of attraction or the secret. I remember when I first learned about the movie, The Secret, uh, my mom shared it with me. I was much younger and it planted a seed. I was probably 18 years old. How old was I in 2006? Because I know the movie came out in 2006. So yeah, something like that. And what happened is when I watched this movie, there was something inside of me that clicked and it felt like it resonated, but I, it was before my spiritual awakening and it was something I resisted even watch at the beginning. I was just hanging out with friends. We were playing poker and, uh, and then my mom was like, Hey, you got to watch it. So I come into the, her room and I start watching it and like, it sucked me in like five minutes in, I just wanted to keep watching it. There was something about it that really did resonate. And that started and planted a seed for me. And then years later, I worked a nine to five sales commission job at Nordstrom's and women's shoes. And I started to apply the law of attraction. I started to, cause every day that we went in and we started at zero and we only got paid 10% commission on whatever we sold. And what we did is, or what I did is every day I'd go in, I would notice my energy, the kind of intentions I had, the goals that I have. And I would see the kind of result that I would get from that. And from that, I was able to really look at the energy dynamics of the law of attraction in my own life. And even beyond that, then obviously I went from working that nine to five job to doing what I love full time. And there were a lot of things I learned along the way. And what I want to do in this episode is I want to share with you the top insights that I've had and also the advanced manifestation practices and principles that I think have transformed my life more than anything else. So first off, when we talk about this, um, let me kind of just back up and share with you my journey of the law of attraction. So like I said, I listened, watched, listened to the secret back in, uh, 20, 2006. It was before my spiritual awakening, but nonetheless, it was something I became kind of something that really resonated with me. And at the time I was working at Nordstrom's and Women's Shoes when I really started to apply it. So that's like a, it's like a retail sales job. You get paid a commission on what you're sold, on what you sell every day. And what I liked about that is I can kind of control my paychecks in a way. The energy that I put in would be what I got out. And um, if I was willing to learn more or work harder, then I would make more money. And I liked having that control. I didn't really like having the idea of going to a nine to five job where you only have a certain amount of money you can make. So what I did is um, I started really practicing it. I remember I would, I would watch, there was this couple of videos by Dr. Wayne Dyer. I think he has them, I think they're called The Power of Intention. And when I was, uh, was it called The Power of Intention? Yeah, something like The Power of Intention. There were talks on YouTube. And I would go to this place called the E-Bar at Nordstrom's, which is the, it's like their little coffee shop. And I would sit there and I would watch and listen to YouTube videos on my phone of Dr. Wayne Dyer. And there was just something that really resonated with me and something that began to open up different, different levels to me. And at that time as well, I was really learning about the power of the mind because I was getting out of using what is called, um, 
Adderall. So Adderall is the prescription drug that they give to kids or to people that have what is called ADHD. So I, uh, from, from seven to 16 years old, many of you know the story, but I didn't have much freedom in my life. I had an ex-stepmom in my life who was very emotionally and mentally uh, controlling and abusive. So after 16, 17 came around, 17, my brother and I we had freedom and our personalities began to came out. We had all this pent up energy from not being allowed to have friends, not being allowed to watch TV, not being allowed to eat the kind of food that we want, uh, having to earn to go to school activities, normally just doing chores all day. All of a sudden we could do th cool th stuff. So when that happened, I came out of my shell and started to express myself. And it was almost like all that pent up energy for so long wanted to come out. So at that job that I had, that nine to five job selling women's shoes, I was just very loud. I would mess with customers. I would have a lot of fun. Like almost like when you're, when you're that controlled for that period of time, you almost feel like you don't have you. It's almost ex everything is exciting after that. Almost everything, any negative situation, it's like, well, it could be worse. <laughs> I could be around this ex step mom person. So I'm not there anymore. So I'm actually grateful for where I am. So, um, at the time I was taking Adderall for ADHD, which is what the doctors prescribed me, which helped because when I would take that at work, I would sell so much shoes. <laughs> it would like zone me into this mode to where I could just focus. I wouldn't forget shoes and stuff like that. Like helping at people at Nordstrom's, the way that it worked is you could have as many customers as you'd want. Like I could pick up four customers at a time and my coworker could be standing over there with no customers. And that would be his fault because he should have picked up the customers. <laughs> at, at Barney's New York, where I worked later, if you got a second customer, you had to pass it off to someone. You were only allowed to have one customer at a time, which is very weird for me to get used to. But basically, when I would take Adderall, I became like almost like in the movie Limitless. Now Adderall, by the way, has crazy harsh side effects. It's literally like legal meth. It's methamphetamine. Um, and it's so bad. It's like, I, I don't, I'm not recommending anyone take it, but when I would take it, it was like the movie Limitless. I would just get into this mode and I'd be able to help customers and I would make so much money. And what happened is I knew I wanted to get off of Adderall because the side effects were you couldn't eat very much, you couldn't sleep very much. And that caused me also to have to go home at night. And what I would do is every night when I get off, I'd go home and I'd smoke a lot of weed because that would balance out not being able to eat or sleep, what are the side effects of weed? <laughs> you can eat, you can sleep. <laughs> it's very easy to eat. It's very easy to, it's easier to fall asleep. So that's, that was my balance. Adderall during the day, weed at night. And I was like, man, I feel like I'm dependent on these substances. It didn't feel good. So what I did is I ended up um, being like, okay, I want to get rid of this. I want to let that go. And at the time I was learning about the law of attraction, the power of the mind, the power of beliefs. And I started to let that go. And you know, you know, wonder how, let me tell you about the peak. The peak was I would go to work every day. I'd go get four shots of espresso because when I would drink espresso, it would calm my energy down. I would literally be like super solid at four shots of espresso. And what I would do is I'd do four shots of espresso. Then I would also have had my Adderall. Then I'd be going into work. I'd be selling. I'd be making so much money. And then I go to my break. I wouldn't really be that hungry. <laughs> so I'd be watching Dr. Wade Dyer videos. And then, um, eventually though, after months of doing this, I'm like, this cannot be good on my body. I'd actually have this weird thing that would happen. My, there was this one time I was helping a customer and my hands started twitching and she goes, this customer goes, are you okay? And I was like, yeah. I was like, this is so weird. <laughs> I was just like, I was like looking at my hand and it was like doing this weird twitch thing that I couldn't stop. And I knew it was my nerves or adrenals. I have no idea what it was. But in that moment, I decided, okay, I have to stop taking this Adderall. And even to this day, by the way, I do not drink caffeine. Not that that makes me better than anybody. I don't drink alcohol. I don't do any pharmaceutical at all. The only supplements I use is what you've heard me talk about in this podcast many times, which is Organifi. And that's what I take in the morning is Organifi greens. And what this is, is just a little powdered juice that I put into water. And then I drink that. That gives me energy. There's zero crash because when I used to take coffee, even though I was calm, I would still crash, feel lower energies after it. Or at my peak, I also drink a lot of very like green tea with matcha in it. That was even at Nordstrom's. And I would drink that during the holiday season because we'd be so busy. We'd literally be working like 50 something, 60 hours a week and running around like selling shoes. It was so much work. Um, 
And we would t- I'd take that and that's how I would focus. But then uh, eventually I got off of that. Now all I take is Organifi greens in the morning with a little bit of water and that gives me energy throughout the day. It's the way I break my fast too because it's actually good on the stomach and there's zero crash. And I use Organifi and um, I use all their products. Many of you know that. Spon- I talk about it on sponsorships on the podcast all the time. But Organifi, they have the protein as well that I use every almost twice a day. I make a protein ice cream out, out of it, which is super simple to make. Um, so it's Organifi Protein, Organifi Green. There's also Organifi Gold that I drink at night. Those are the three that I use. They're all very healthy. They're low in calories. Most of them have almost no sugar. Um, and they're super healthy. And if you didn't know, you can go to Organifi.com forward slash Aaron to get 15% off. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash A-A-R-O-N. And you can get 15% off of Organifi. Get the green, the protein. The chocolate is the best one, in my opinion. I like chocolate better than vanilla. And then also the uh, chocolate gold. Those are like my three favorite. Anyways, kind of a side note here, but it, it went in perfectly with what I was talking about. Um, I realized I wanted to get off Adderall and I wanted to focus more on my own energy and not need it. So one thing that I did is I started realizing and started becoming aware of my own belief systems. And I realized that part of my identity, one of the biggest things that changed my life was when I looked at my own identity. So the way I used to see myself when I went in at Nordstrom's is every single day there was a chart in the back of the stock room of the top salespeople from the day before. And there was always one or two people that were at the top. This guy named Tony, he's a top salesperson, and then this one other guy. And then I was always in the middle. And I wasn't bad, like I wasn't towards the bottom, but I wasn't towards the top. Now, I bet you could have looked at who was consistently where on this page, and you could have saw people's self-image of what they thought they were worthy of selling because there was a consistency there. The person that was at the top probably saw himself as a top salesperson. The person at the bottom probably saw themselves as always trying to get by. And the people at the bottom that were consistently at the bottom, they normally had to like fear for their job because the way that it works is you have to, you have to stay within a certain number range of the average of the department in order for you to keep your job. Otherwise you get written up and then you can, you can end up getting let go. And I saw some people get let go because of that. But the people that were at the bottom, guess what? They had a self image that was not as good as, um, not as, not as they didn't see themselves as high or as good as salespeople. That was part of their self image. When I was learning from Dr. Wayne Dyer, power of intention, there were some other videos I started to watch on self image. So what I did is I started to, I literally went into that job or I went in one day and I started to see myself as a top salesperson. And not only that, I started to act as a top salesperson. I started to realize how I, like there was this kind of underlying notion now that I look back, how I do one thing is how I do everything. So I'd get into this flow to where when I would help people, I would just do it 100% focused on the one customer I was helping. Even I was helping two or three customers when I was talking to them, I was only talking to them and I would just focus on giving it my best and like really helping them, really adding value. And what happened is, over the course of a couple of days of doing this, I literally started to become at the top of the list consistently because I started to see myself at the top of that list. So that was interesting. As I started to do that, that changed so much. So self-image. The question I have for you is how do you see yourself? Not only in work, career, how do you see yourself in relationships with other people? What is your self-image? What is your story also? What is your story, which means your beliefs about love? What is your beliefs about money? What is your beliefs about success? Because these beliefs most likely are on autopilot and they're keeping you in the same place. They're either keeping you at the top of the list, at the bottom of the list, in the middle of the list. I was mediocre until I realized that, then I became much more. And you could change that at any moment. So this was part of the journey that I learned. And even as I started at, at, at eventually I quit at Nordstrom's, then got hired at Barney's New York. I went on a six month hiatus where I just went through a spiritual awakening. I was like, I don't want a job. <laughs> and I, I just was like studying stuff. Um, I lived at my mom. So I was like able to kind of do that for a while. And I was just really going inwards. And then eventually I was like, okay, I got to get a job. 
applied at Barney's, got the job like the next day, literally. And what ended up happening is eventually I used that same process to go full-time on YouTube. I started to see myself as a full-time YouTuber and I started to be a full-time YouTuber. I started to make daily videos regardless of what the outer circumstance looks like. I made daily videos, the intention of adding value, and over time it began to compound and things started to grow and I got better at being on video. This consistency creates more dialing in. So those aren't even the, that wasn't even the esoteric. That was just, uh, let me see what, okay. So the first advanced manifestation principle that has changed my life is one that you don't hear of very often, but what it is, is it is called, and you've heard me talk about it before, but it's not talked about often in the mainstream, at least it's called importance, importance, anything we make very important, we create resistance around. So the thing, the thing with importance is I learned about this from a book that I used to read and, um, and I, I realized that in life and even in that job that I used to have, anytime I put a customer on a pedestal, anytime I was dating someone and I put them on a pedestal, um, from doing that, it would mess up the energy dynamics. Anything you make very important, you create resistance around. When you create resistance around this thing, you literally block it from coming into your life. It's funny, even when I was first starting to grow on YouTube, there'd be this huge spike, this huge growth. The more that I would focus on it, the more I'd make it very important that I grow, very important that things happen, I'd create resistance. And then it's almost like as a reflection in life, those things would slow down. But if I'd say, okay, I'm butchering this up vibrationally, I'd realize that sometimes. I'm thinking about this thing too much and I'm trying to control the outcome. What I realize is if I let go, then what would happen is then it would, it would allow the resistance to go around, uh, away. Now, the other side of this is with importance, anything, and think about it, anything you've made very, very important, you've created resistance around and you've blocked Think of times in your life when you made someone else more important than you, when you made a goal really, really important. Imagine when you go into a business meeting, you're like, I have to close this deal. If I don't close this deal, then oh my gosh, all this crazy stuff's going to happen. When you go in, you're going to have this resistant energy. The person's going to feel that on you. You're setting up the dynamics to where you feel like you're less than them. And they can feel that. People feel what you feel about you. Let me say that one more time. People can feel what you feel about you. And if you feel that someone else is more important than you, then they're going to feel that inferior, inferiority, inferior emotion coming off of you. Speaking about pressure, I had an ex-girlfriend who worked at uh, some, what is it called? Wyndham. It was like some timeshare place. And she was like a marketer there. And the way that they would manage them is like, if they did not make their numbers, like every customer they helped, if they didn't sell them on going to some timeshare thing, then they would get like in trouble or written up or something like that. That's how cutthroat it was. And it would create so much pressure that some people would actually do well. Like they worked well under that pressure, but a lot of people, there's so much resistance. The people that worked well are probably the people that didn't make it very important, even though they had management breathing down in their back. Like if you don't close this person on coming to this, giving this free gift so that they come to this uh, timeshare meeting, then you're going to um, get fired or something like that. So what she ended up doing is um, it was just very obvious that it was a very resistant place to work, but also just think about importance there, putting things on a pedestal, making things very important. So what it is also saying with the, her, with the whole um, importance thing is it is saying that my self-image, that's why I talked about self-image a little bit ago, my self-image is not linked up to the ideal version of myself, of, of my ideal version. So for example, you put someone else on a pedestal. You're like, this person's a 10 out of 10 would recommend. <laughs> what you do is when you're around them, you feel kind of anxious, like, oh, I hope everything goes well. I hope they like me. But then what happens 
is it saying my self-image, it is not natural for me to talk to this kind of person. It's not natural. They are either better than me or whatever. Now, the goal isn't that you become better than them. The goal is that you see everything as neutral. The goal is that no one is better or worse than anybody else, but that you have your own worth. You are worthy. And as you realize your own sense of worthiness, people feel that off of you, remember? What do people feel? <laughs> people feel what you feel about you. So if you link up your self-image and you see it as natural for people to be attracted to you, then guess what? You're not going to clam up so much when you talk to them. If you see it as natural for you to close those big business deals, then guess what? It's going to be natural for you. It's not going to be this huge like, oh my gosh, do I sign the paper here? Oh my God, I can't believe you're signing this paper. Oh my goodness. And then you repel them. Instead of repelling them, they're like, oh, this is natural. You make it natural for your self-image. It is natural for me to make daily videos on YouTube. And people used to always ask me when I first was on YouTube and other creators, they were like, they were like, how do you do that? How do you make videos every single day on YouTube? Well, it's, it wasn't actually hard. And it isn't hard if I chose to go back to daily videos. It just becomes a part of my self-image. Just not now my self-image and my identity is changing to where I'm not just a YouTuber. I'm also focused on other stuff. So if you make it a part of your identity and you don't make something more important than you, you're not creating resistance around it and it becomes natural. When we make something more important, what we are vibrationally saying is this is not natural for me to experience this. If you put someone else on a pedestal and it's very important that things go well with them, you, what you're saying is you are better than me. My self-image is not linked up with it for it to be natural for me to talk to you. But instead what you do is you link up your self-image and you decrease importance by letting go of importance, by letting go of things being very, very important. And what you end up focusing on is more so yourself, your own energy. You focus on how you see yourself showing up in the world in the way you prefer. So what are the first esoteric principles that took me eight years to learn is this whole importance thing. It's not something that's very often talked about. However, that leads me into the second one, which is all about chasing, which is kind of similar to when we're chasing something, we're, we're making it more important, but, verse, but not just that. When we chase something, this is something that's profoundly changed my life. If I'm here and my goal is here and I'm chasing this goal, I'm saying that the happiness this goal will bring me, the satisfaction this goal will bring me, is outside of myself. And that if, if I get this thing, then I'll feel happy. And anything you chase, you imply that that thing is running away. If you chase a person, you're implying they're energetically running away. I used to work with this lady and um, she told, we, we, she, she was tell, talking to me because when you work at these sales commission jobs, by the way, a lot of it, you're just standing around talking to each other. <laughs> and there was this guy at one of our friends, um, he was dating this one chick on the third floor or something like that. And she's like, do you notice that everyone he dates and anytime she, he's chasing someone, it's, it's, it means that the other person is running. Think about that. It's almost like if you chase money, you're implying that the money is running away from you because you're chasing it. And what happens if you have a dog and you start chasing the dog, the dog will start running because it thinks it's trying to, you're trying to play with it. And the same way, money is the same way. If you chase money, you are vibrationally implying money is running away from you, which means that your relationship with money is that you believe it's either hard to make, you believe it is not natural for you to have it, and that belief is causing you to either block it or attract it into your life, depending on what your belief about money and your relationship about money is. So realize, though, that money, even of itself, if you're chasing money, realize money is a symbol. Money has no built-in meaning other than the meaning we give it, but it is a symbol of energy exchange on the planet. When people go for the outer thing, it is like trying to treat the symptoms and not the cause. What causes money? That's the symptom. The money is the symptom of the value and what, of what you can provide in the world. Instead of focusing on the money, focus on the value. When you focus on the value, when I started making YouTube videos, I was not focused on the subscribers. 
I was focused on the value that I could provide to people listening to the videos about how to make um, changes in life, about understanding these metaphysical principles, how making spirituality practical. I focused on adding as much value as I could. And as I focused on the value, the subscribers came. As I focused on helping people, abundance came. And one of the biggest problems I see is that people chase money, people chase love, people chase these things not knowing that they may have a belief, a relationship with it that implies that that thing is running away from them. If you are chasing a person in your life, you are implying that that person is running and you most likely have a belief that you are not worthy of it or that it naturally is just running away from you. So what this does is we are here, we're chasing this thing over here. Instead of chasing that thing, it's, it's focusing on the inside of how do I relate to this thing? How do I relate to this thing? And what we do is as we become aware, sorry if the microphone sounds kind of weird, I'm trying to adjust it. Um, as we focus on our relationship, we will then see that the outer reality begins to change. I've changed my beliefs around money and abundance. I used to have this belief that, oh, it's, I'm a spiritual person sharing these ideas online. I shouldn't want money that's evil, that's low vibrational. But then I realized it's energy exchange. And then also that the abundance that I make, I can reinvest that into my business, into my mission to help more and more people. I can then hire people. Then I, I have more time to do what I actually love. It's reframing the meaning, changing it within ourselves. A lot of spiritual people have negative beliefs about money because they believe that money is this, this 3D thing. For a period of time on our planet, money will be around. So we might as well embrace it and focus on the energy exchange. Focus on the value we're putting out in the world rather than, because if we feel guilty or have negative emotions about it, we think it's bad, then guess what? If it's bad and we want to be good, then we're, we're going to repel it. And then we're going to wonder why we still have to have a 9-to-5 job that we don't like. Or we don't have enough to just like really let loose and go on vacation, spend quality time with family or to grow our mission even more or whatever it is. So don't chase. Feel the emotions of also having what you want now. This thing over here that you're chasing, it's going to give you a certain emotion. The money gives you freedom or security or whatever money means to you. Love gives you connection, compassion, love, whatever that feeling is that, that a relationship means to you. For some people, it could be security. It could be different emotions. But what are you craving? Give yourself those emotions and find ways of feeling those emotions now. You can give yourself permission to feel those emotions. Even before we hit certain goals on YouTube, I would just feel the emotions of already having that. I'm already worthy. I don't need these things in the external world in order to feel this way. And the irony, the paradox is that by feeling those emotions now, guess what happens? Those things come quicker than ever because you are then in vibrational resonance to it. If you let go of the wanting of something, you can then just have it. And you say, I want, you say, I lack. I want money. Why would you want money? Because I don't, you don't have it. Therefore, you want it. And the thing that you can begin to do is you can begin to give yourself permission to just have and be. Don't even just have, be. Be abundant. Be who you came here to be. And by being that way, guess what? You're going to have more magnetic energy. You're going to notice that you just carry yourself differently. So second one is don't chase it. Go within yourself. Change your beliefs and your stories about these things. And you'll see that things begin to change. And the last one has to do with understanding that all truths are true. So the third manifestation principle that has changed my life over the last eight years is that all truths are true. Now what this means is that anything you believe to be true is being reflected back to you. Now, this, my beliefs have changed as I've even gone through the manifestation process. Back in the day, something that I needed to hear that actually helped me was to take action. I was working that nine to five job. I wasn't, I was selling women's shoes at Barney's New York at this point. And I knew I wanted to be on YouTube. I knew I wanted to share ideas, but I didn't know what to do. And the way that I thought about manifestation was I was like, oh, I'm just going to think about it. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to think about it. But I didn't get much results. I'd have cool little synchronicities happen. Met Jack Canfield, helped Tony Robbins' wife, <laughs> Sage Robbins. 
um, stuff like that, like things that were in alignment with things I wanted to do, meet these people, right? But nothing really came of it. Then I had this epiphany that I almost imagined my future self, what my future self would tell me. And basically the message I got was to make a video every single day on YouTube for the next year and your life will transform. So I said, okay, that's what I'll do. So I started making daily videos. When I started making daily videos, my self-image started to change. I started to see myself as what you could call a hard worker. And I started to realize that physical action really got me great results when it's aligned with passion. So physical action, passion. As I began doing and being in that mode, it served me. I went from working that nine to five job to then started growing within a month. I went from 3,500 subscribers on YouTube to th almost like 20 something thousand. And then it just kept growing, kept growing, kept growing. And guess what? Within six months, quit that nine to five job, went full time. But then I realized I had to develop a belief system that meant I had to work hard to be successful. And even two years, two and a half years after making daily videos on YouTube, I literally made daily videos on YouTube for over, after one year, I was already at 200,000 subs. I don't think I had to keep making daily videos the way that I did, but I guess it served me for a period of time. But then I developed a belief system that said that I have to work hard to be successful. I became aware of this belief system while I was at a life transformation spa in Costa Rica and I did ayahuasca, which is plant medicine. So I tell myself I never do. I'm never gonna, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do caffeine. I would never do that kind of stuff. I ended up doing ayahuasca. And when I did it, guess what happened? I realized that I became aware of my shadow and that I believed things had to be hard. I believed that I had to work hard to be successful and I wasn't really enjoying life that much. I was always focused on the future. I was always focused on achieving more. It was almost never enough. So what I eventually had to do is I had to let go of that belief that I had to work hard and I started working smart. I started hiring people. I started, I, I was so bent up on like doing my own YouTube editing that took me like a year and a half before I even hired an editor. I was like, no, I have to do it. It has to be my, and I had the most basic, simple editing process ever. But I, I was like, I have to do it. It's special to me. It was so ridiculous now that I look back at it. But I had to let go of my control. I also had to let go of my belief that I had to work hard to be successful so that I could then allow more abundance and more more abundance and more um, also just life to be easier and more enjoyable. And as I began to change my perception on it like that, guess what? Things did become much easier. Um, letting go of those beliefs and it's not just beliefs, it's also my self-image. Even now, as I move into not just doing YouTube videos, now I do three videos a week on YouTube, I do the podcast. The podcast is probably my main focus right now. But my focus is also growing something that I'm working on right now. And it's changed my self-image. But sometimes it's scary to let go of one's self-image. To let go of just being the daily YouTuber, it was kind of scary. Before that, it was kind of scary to let go of that job because it brought, it brought stability, even though I knew I didn't really like it. It brought stability. Letting go of hard work was scary. I believing I had to work hard because I'm taking a lot of action. I was like, if I stop taking so much action, am I going to lose this momentum? That was scary to me. But any time that I had those feelings and I actually trusted the universe and realized that this is also about alignment, enjoying life as well. I enjoyed life when I wasn't working so freaking hard all the time and trying to get somewhere else in the future. So... What I've learned is that even though there's a certain container that you may take on for a period of time, you'll eventually let that go. Even if you're like, okay, I'm gonna, I developed this story, this identity that I can make 150K a year and you're making like 70K a year. Guess what? 150K a year is gonna be really cool. It's gonna be awesome. But eventually, you're gonna even move beyond that. And when you do, you're gonna see that that was a limitation. Me having that hard work belief mentality, it serves me. But then I started to think that because it served me for a year or two, it's going to serve me forever rather than understanding that I can then work smarter and more aligned and enjoy the process more. doesn't mean I don't work at all. I definitely, I love what I do. If you love what you do, you won't mind working, but it means that the way and you relate to it has changed. There's things that you can do daily.
that will begin to transform your life. On the other side of this, there's things that you must stop doing daily in order to also create the life of your dreams. And in this video, this episode, I'm gonna share with you step-by-step step exactly what to do daily that you will look back three to six months from now and see this is the video, this is the episode that changed everything for you. Follow the practical advice I give you in this video. This isn't just esoteric abstract concepts that you can uh, kind of begin to apply in your life to get a change. These are practical step-by-step, -step, no BS things that you can do to completely transform your life and turn your dreams into reality. Welcome back to another episode on the Aaron Dowdy podcast. Now, I'm looking and I'm thinking about my life and how much it's transformed over the last three to five years. And in the last three to five years, I've gone from working a nine to five job that I was not passionate about to doing what I love. Even right now, as I record this, I'm getting ready to move from mainly being on YouTube and making content uh, like via video to in-person events. We have, uh, I think three or five events scheduled for next year. And I can tell that th the dream reality that I've envisioned has definitely come to fruition. A lot of the things that I used to imagine have happened. And that's the inspiration behind this video. And um, it's funny, I, I never actually would have saw though myself living in Austin, Texas. I live in Austin, Texas. I never really visualized that exactly. Um, I think I probably did at one point visualize and imagine living by the beach, but I go to the beach and I go to, I go to Costa Rica twice a year. I uh, go to California, which is where my girlfriend lives, which is pretty much on the beach. And uh, it's interesting, but the vision has changed over the last two or three years, but it's definitely been one of uh, like an abundant, transformative, my dreams have become reality type experiences. And I wanna share with you the missing keys to it and the things that I wish I would have known three years ago that would have expedited the process. Because I had to get really honest with myself back in 2017. Now, one of the things you must stop doing in order to then you know turn your dreams into reality is you must stop telling yourself the story that this is just about thinking thoughts. That's just about, you just gonna think your way to your dreams. And I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news here, but I'm just sharing with you what actually worked for me. It was not just thinking, it, actually in fact, thinking the better thought ideology did help me get out of some of like the thinking, the negative thoughts and not identifying with thoughts. But when I saw the movie, The Secret and some of the most stereotypical ways of looking at manifestation, I can see that I felt blocked and I felt stuck and I was thinking about it. I was visualizing it. I had the wallpaper on my computer, had a photo of me and it was funny. One time I had a, I had a photo of me and I had a, uh, like a, uh, I edited out a YouTube channel. It was my YouTube profile photo of me the one before I have what you now see on YouTube. And what I did, because it was the same one for like four years. And then next to that, where it was the photo of me, it said uh, like, a, it said like 106,000 subscribers, 106,000 subscribers, 106K subscribers. And what I did is I screenshot, I photo edited it because I had like a hundred subscribers and I put it on my desktop and I would sit every time I'd open up my computer, that was like my vision board. I would see that, I would see like, um, at the time I was single, so I think I had like, uh, I was seeing myself like dating beautiful women. I saw myself like going to California and traveling. I saw myself, I had like a picture of a very nice house that I wanted to live in. And the interesting thing was one time my sister came into my room and she goes, oh my God, you have 100,000 subscribers? She thought that that background was like the window was open or something and she like freaked out. And it was like this funny moment because um, I was like, no, this is my vision board. You know, I had to explain it to her, but I, I would, I had the vision board and I would open it up every day and I would look at it. And then I would go to my nine to five job. And what I had to do is I had to become very honest with myself because I was living in a reality where I kept justifying where I was. And I, I just didn't know it was unclear to me. What do I actually do to create my dream reality? Cause I'm thinking about it. And the thing is, is this is not about just thinking better thoughts. I'm sorry. Like if, if you've been having blocks and you've been feeling stuck, 
Maybe it's because you're thinking the thoughts, but you're missing the other two components of this. And the other two components for me were the missing ones. Now, back in 2017, some of you guys know the story, but in February of 2017, I was living at my dad's house and I had a lot of blocks and I felt stuck because the, the reasonings we have, there's a lot of things that will hold us back from starting. And if I, if I were to say there's one main thread of this video and of this episode, it's the key and the thing that you must do every single day is you must start. You must start to create the YouTube channel that you know that you're gonna be passionate about. You must start to ask that person out that you may be afraid to ask out. You must start dating if you've been holding yourself back from dating. You must start, um, it depends on what you wanna attract. If you wanna attract love, there's things you must start doing. If you wanna attract uh, more abundance, there's things you must start doing. But the one thing that you must really start is to start to align yourself to your dream reality and live in it now. For me, there was a year or two where I didn't start. I didn't start making the video. I didn't start even with where I was because I had blocks. And I think in my mind, I thought that, okay, I have these blocks to, uh, you know, making the videos or I don't, I have these blocks because I don't know exactly what to do. But the blocks were there to keep me in familiar territory. Those blocks were there to keep me safe. And it wasn't like, you know, in, in my mind, it was like, oh, once I do X, Y, Z, then I'll be ready. Once the blocks go away, then I'll be ready. The blocks aren't gonna go, there's no time you're actually gonna be ready. I can see now that when it comes to attracting love, I had blocks because I was afraid of rejection. So I was afraid to be my true self. I was afraid of getting rejecting. I had this people pleaser mentality that would kind of come out. And then I can see that the key is I had to go into the unknown. And one thing I did is I, um, for love at least, I had to stop judging women, the woman I, like, I would go on dates with. I'd have all these reasons to why it won't work out. And it was like these self-sabotaging things. I had to also realize that those were also intimacy blocks that I had. And I had to open up my heart. And I had to put myself and like put myself out there, the real me. And as I did that, it was a completely different response in reality. It was like I was wiring in a more of a like a leadership version of me. But I had to break out of the un like what's comfortable to us may be. Let's talk about like love and dynamics and relationships. What's comfortable to us may have been attracting people that don't choose us. That might be comfortable. I know that there's one or two friends in my, in, that uh, I talk to that are going through this right now. They're going through like this trauma bond thing and they, she, she keeps going back to this guy that's like a friend of mine that she can tell is um, not choosing her and she's feeling not chosen, but that was also the energy dynamic of growing up of what she felt. So it's a familiar pattern. And the key to this though is opening up the heart then puts you in this unfamiliar territory, but that's the key to creating your dream life. It's stepping out of the known and into the unknown because that's where all the magic happens. In 2017, I made the choice to go daily on YouTube, living at my dad's house, had all these stories. I can't make YouTube videos. I live at my dad's house. I have this pool, my dad's pool in the backyard, but it's not my pool. You know, I felt like, I felt like, how am I going to talk about the law of attraction and self-help stuff when I don't, I don't live in my own house or, you know, I'm working this nine to five job I don't like. But what I had to do is I had to still take action anyways. And at the time, for a long time, for six months of making YouTube videos, uh, before I even made videos, I was like, I don't know how to edit. I don't have any editing skills. I had to go online and look up how to like edit on iMovie. And I had to like just figure it out. And even then I couldn't figure out certain things. So in my first YouTube vid video, it says insert title here <laughs> in the middle of my face for like the first 15 seconds. I didn't know how to change it but I still put it out anyways. You have to start. That's the key to you creating your dream reality is to simply, first off, start and stop telling yourself the excuses that have kept you safe for so long. This is really going to transform your life if you simply apply that. And I know this too because um, my buddy Victor and I, we have uh, something called full-time purpose where we help people go full-time doing what they love. So we're helping people that like know they have a spiritual message or a mission or a gift that they want to share with the world and they don't know how to do that or um, they're holding themselves back. And it, it's the most common thing we see is 
people just procrastinate and they don't start. They just keep waiting. They keep waiting to have the right editing equipment, to have the right software, to have the right, um, the right camera equipment. They, they're waiting to be told by their, they're waiting for the certificate. They're waiting to get the life coach certificate or the NLP certification or the healing thing. They're waiting for someone to tell them they're good enough. They're just waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting. And the thing is, is the longer you wait, the more you're putting your dreams on, re on, on hold. There is no perfect time. There will never be a perfect time. And even when you start, you will move through the blocks. The blocks are going to be waiting for you, whether you do it now or in three, six months from now. It's about stepping into the unknown and having the courage. If there was one message of this episode, it'd also be courage. Having the courage to simply start. Now, another thing that will hold you back from creating your dream reality, as we were talking about earlier, is the thinking the better thought mentality. The thing that I needed to hear that I didn't want to hear back in 2017 is to take massive action. This is the practical side of me. This is my Taurus rising side of me, maybe. And uh, I used to always, I used to always not like the Taurus at my chart. I don't know why. I, I'm a Taurus rising, a Gemini moon, and a Sagittarius sun. And I was like, I like the fire sign. I like the Gemini. But the Taurus, I, I, I think it's because I dated an ex-girlfriend that was a Taurus, and she was so stubborn. And I was like, I don't like the, the I'm, I'm stubborn. I understand I am stubborn. The Taurus in my chart is also me uh, liking, like I like really good food. I like luxury things. I live in a pretty luxury house. I like trap, like I like to be grounded. It's the practical side of me. If I didn't have Taurus in my chart, as a side note, I know, but if I didn't have Taurus in my chart, my YouTube videos would be much more airy. I'd be like, just, I would be like, hey, just think of better thought, guys. You don't need to do anything. Just think of better thought. And I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be as, as good as a big as I am on YouTube. You wouldn't have found my videos. So the practical side of me that used to not want to hear this, I've now embraced my Taurus side. I understand that taking massive action is extraordinarily powerful. So back in 20... Um, 17, I started to take massive action. I remember hearing, uh, who was it? Ralph Smart was talking about take massive action. And I'm like, what? That does not sound high vibrational. It sounds much higher vibrational just to sit here and just to think better thoughts and to visualize what I want and just to get into utter alignment with it. But the truth is the way reality works is this three-step process. It's see it, be vi vi visualize what you want, be clear as to what you want and who you want to become, feel it. Feel it as if it's here now, which means also have the beliefs that generate that emotion because your beliefs generate emotion. So believe that you're capable, like really believe in yourself. And then lastly, be it. See it, feel it, be it. See it, feel it, be it. You don't get in life that what you want, but you always get a reflection of who you are being. You always get a reflection of who you're being. By the way, I'm going to go out and say this. And first off, I'm not taking like this. this I'm giving all the credit to the, where it's due. Okay. But I do want to share this story with you guys because it is such a powerful inspiration of somebody that is applying these, these uh, concepts, these universal truths, okay? I don't know if any of you guys have ever watched UFC, all right? UFC, there's, uh, uh, it's, it's fighting. Some people look at it and go, oh my God, it's so low vibrational because people are hitting each other. But it, it's like, an, it is like, a, it's a sport and it's, uh, there's a lot of like different styles in it and stuff. Anyways, there's this one person um, there's this one person whose name is Juliana Pena. I don't hope I'm saying that right. Juliana Pena. And she's somebody that really believed in her, believes in herself. She is a woman's, uh, Bantamweight division fighter at 135. And she recently went against someone named Amanda Nunez. Amanda Nunez is the GOAT, the best of all time inside of her. She's, she has the 145 belt and the 135 belt, 135 pounds, 145 pounds. She has beaten some of the, the best people and like, she's just kind of, she's considered the goat. All right. Juliana Pena fought Amanda Nunez and she simply believed in herself. Now, let me preface this. How do I know she believes in the teachings or in the law of attraction and stuff like that? Three, uh, two or three months ago before this fight. Now this fight happened, um, this fight, there's a whole story behind this. And, uh, okay. So this is, this is what happened three months ago. She reached out to me on an Instagram DM and she said, Hey, Aaron, she's like, she was really cool. She's like, I know you're busy, but I just want to know, I just want you to know, like, 
Um, I have a couple questions about the law of attraction. There's like this thing I really want. I really want this, the, the championship belt and I, I believe in it and I visualized it for so long. Like she was really asking for some advice and I gave her quite a bit of advice. I, I, um, I, I sent out voice. I gave her some voice notes and explaining things. I sent her some screenshots of some stuff. And the one thing that she took away though, because she sent me a couple voice notes back and she said, I really think that the taking on the identity of the champion is going to be the key in this. This is what she said. It was always her dream to be a UFC, to be a UFC champion, right? So she's like, I think that what you're saying is I need to take on the embodiment and the, the energy of a champion and, and see it as natural. And that was one of the main things I remember saying in the, in, in everything was see it as natural. So what she does is she, she, and I, I noticed because she had this fight with Amanda Nunez that then what happened is it got put on hold because Amanda got the thing and um, it, she was out for a couple months or whatever. So it got re you know, re put back onto December 11th, which was the fight, I think. And uh, then what happened, and it, it was a really cool experience too, because my dad was in town here in, uh, in Austin and I had some friends over, we had a whole bunch of people over at my house and we were watching it, rooting for Juliana. And my dad is kind of like, you know, come to understand what I do. And I could tell that there was a part of my dad that wanted to like show while being here that he's proud of me and stuff like that. But it's just a really cool experience because we're watching Juliana fight Amanda Nunez. And Amanda Nunez is the far favorite. It's like, I think she was projected to win. Like you had to put down a thousand dollars on Amanda Nunez just to win $100. That's how favored Amanda Nunez was. And Amanda Nunez has really never lost. Maybe she's lost before back in the day, but She's just been unstoppable. And then Juliana, who's the one that sent me the DM months ago, I was just so rooting for her. And also there was like, I was like looking at her energy and she was like carrying herself as a champion. She was not letting Amanda get in her head. And actually the day before the fight, she was doing this press conference. She was getting inside of um, Amanda Nunes' head. I could see Amanda was way more reactive than normal. So the day of the fight, we're all excited. And it's like, I'm, you know, I think th there's a lot of people that just completely counted out Juliana because Amanda was just such a fucker favorite, to be honest with you. She was just so favored to win this fight. And it was, uh, she's now during the fight, the first round, Amanda Nunes kind of did her thing. And, you know, it was, it kind of looked like she, she was, she was winning the second round. There was something that just like switched or Juliana honestly had that look the whole fight. But then what happened is Juliana starts fighting and all of a sudden Amanda Nunez starts getting rocked. She starts getting hit. And, and it almost was like people were, were figuring out that Santa Claus wasn't real. It was like people could not believe Joe Rogan. Everyone is going crazy because Juliana starts winning in the second round. And then Juliana gets on her back, like gets her. And, and you can see this weakness in Amanda Nunez. And all of a sudden, Juliana gets around her back and, and ends up submitting her. And she taps out and she won. She won. She beat like this person that was unbeatable in so many people's eyes. And there was a part I was just so excited as well because she's applying the teaching. She shifted her identity. She is a 135 pound bantamweight champion and she applies exactly what I'm talking about right now. And she did it herself, by the way. I'm not taking, I'm taking zero credit for it. It was actually very embarrassing because when I was watching it, my dad kept like saying like, he, he was just, he was, he thought it was so cool. You know, I was like, dad, like, she did it. Juliana did it herself. She did this whole thing. I just thought it was cool though, that she embodies the teachings of like being the champion, making it natural, stuff like that. You know, my dad seemed to think that I had like a part in it or something like that. And I was like, no, she did that. But, um, but just, I, the reason I'm sharing this with you is because she applied exactly what I'm sharing with you. Take on the identity. You get in life a reflection of who you are being. And she was being a champion from the moment she, before she even stepped into the cage. Even before that, at the press conference the day or two before, like she was being that champion. You could tell she wasn't putting it on a pedestal. It was natural for her. And now she's the champion of the 130. Like her whole entire life has changed now. Because she is beat, one, she beat Amanda Nunes. Two, she's the champion. Like that alone is like, she was a dream of hers. Her dream has come to reality because she's applied that. She's taken massive action. She's put so much work in to get there. Don't, like she had to take massive action. She had to, at the end, I think an important part for her was to not put this on a pedestal. to not like make it more important than it is to realize that as a champion, this is natural for you to be, to be this. 
So that's the reason I'm sharing this with you too, is to understand um, this identity piece. Because unless you take on the identity and you're being it consistently, it, moving forward, your reality won't shift very much. For me, I had to see myself as a full-time YouTuber and I had to follow that up every single day by making a video on YouTube every single day with the intention of adding value back in 2017 and I just kept doing that. It was sometimes challenging. I'd get done at work sometimes at, at 12 midnight because I worked at Barney's New York on the Las Vegas Strip. I'd get done at midnight, I'd go home, I would, I'd make a video, I would then edit the video and then schedule to go out, go to bed at like three in the morning and then wake up and do it again. And there were many days where that would happen. Not all the time, but that did happen because I made a rule with myself. I made a commitment to myself that I am this new person now. And that is something that if you wanna create your dream reality, commit to that identity. Commit to that version of you. Take massive action. Thinking better thoughts will only get you so far. I can see how thinking better thoughts and even thinking thoughts like visualizing meeting Tony Robbins, visualize meeting some people, you know, I met Jack Canfield, I met some other people in my space and I thought they were gonna put me on and give me some opportunity. And there's some spiritual people too that the way they manifest is they just wanna be given things. They just wanna be, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. That is one way of manifestation. But another way, the old school version of me that's like this, it feels like an old guy now because I'm like, you can also earn it, right? Yes, someone can gift you an amazing house or gift you like a cool experience or buy you something. That's one way of abundance. But the other way is the way money works is the more value you put out into the world, money is the exchange system for that. So you can also acquire the money through the value you put out. You can create it like, I'm, I, I, I guess I find pride because I'm self-made. Nobody gave me what I have. I didn't meet Tony Robbins and he put me on. I like made, I think I've made 2000 videos on YouTube over the last four years. That took massive action. So I, I guess I have a little bit of pride with that, but I don't discount the other ways of manifestation where you could be in the right place at the right time. Someone can gift you things. You could live in like an awesome house that someone just lets you live in. There are different options there. Now, um, another thing I want to talk about, and one thing you might want to stop doing to really create your dream life, and, and especially stop doing this daily to create your dream life, is this. This has been a game changer for me over the last week. Literally the last week, everything, like my energy is completely changing. I used to make daily videos on, every, a video every single day on YouTube, and then I was like, oh, I'm just not passionate about that anymore. So now I do like three podcast episodes a week on YouTube, and... I, I figured, oh, my motivation just kind of went away. Maybe I'm not passionate about it. I want to do live events, which is somewhat true. Here's another aspect of it though. Over the last like eight months, I have watched, I've gotten more dopamine high than ever before off of watching television shows on Netflix. Back in the day, I watched a whole series called Vikings. Amazing series, by the way. I, I like that series so much that I follow the actors on the show Vikings on Instagram. <laughs> That's how much I like the show Vikings. I watched it and every night I would look forward to watching it and I'd go and I'd lay in my love sack at the, the, the last house I was living in and I would just watch Vikings. And sometimes my girlfriend was in town and Heather and I would just sit there and watch Vikings. She's actually the one that got me in the show. And it was awesome. I get the dopamine rush at the end of the day, do some work in the morning. Then after Vikings end, I was like, huh, I kind of miss it. So then I found a show called Game of Thrones. And I started watching Game of Thrones and guess what? I got sucked right in. I watched like the whole entire series, which is like 10 to 10 episodes slash an hour long each, like size six seasons or something. Like it was a very long, you know, these big commitments, but big dopamine dumps at the end of the night, right? After that, my assistant comes to town and her with her and her boyfriend. And guess what she introduced me to? Narcos. And I'm like, I justify Narcos because half of it's in Spanish and I'm learning Spanish because I'm, I'm watching the subtitles and I'm hearing it. I watched the whole entire series of the Colombian Narcos and then I watched the whole entire one of the Mexico Narcos. And I'm realizing that my dreams, by the way, after all of these shows at night, I'd go to bed at night and I'd have these dreams about whatever I was dreaming about. I watched Squid Games. I'd have dreams about me being locked in a place having to escape. I watched Vikings. I'd have literally dreams I was in battle. I actually like those dreams, by the way. I thought they were really cool because <laughs> Vikings are just a cool thing to me. Um, same with Game of Thrones. 
Game of Thrones is pretty, pretty intense, like some of the visuals and stuff, but I just have these crazy dreams. As of a week ago, I stop watching television at night. I watch a little bit, but then what I do is I focus more on the video I'm gonna make the next day. I'm, I'm wearing my blue blockers at night. I'm going to bed earlier and it has completely revolutionized my own energy. I have so much more motivation. And I remember when I was going full time with my passion, when I was turning my dreams into reality, it required a lot of focus. It did not just thinking better thoughts, but focus and action. And that's where my dopamine would go. So I'm not saying get lost in it, but I can tell that that was such an important part of my reality is like, is like really putting a lot of energy into it. And my YouTube channel does better when I put my own energy into YouTube. When I outsource everything and I have other editors and stuff like that, like um, it, I, I can tell that my energy in it more does better. Doesn't mean I edit my videos because I don't, but there's like certain, I can tell that like now I'm more passionate about YouTube and I can tell it's doing better. It's, it's interesting how it works. But you have to, like the energy going into it is important. And for me, by stopping watching television that's just giving me dopamine releases, I can tell that I now have more energy to put in my passion. I have more energy and it's just more fulfilling. So one thing I would highly recommend you do is you stop putting energy into stuff that you know is not programming you in a powerful way. Don't watch the news. What, like reward yourself with certain television shows, but don't let it, don't overdo it. Cause there were nights I'd watch three or four episodes of Narcos. That's a lot of coke. That's a lot of drugs and a lot of people being killed and a lot of bodies being hidden. It's a lot of like negative things that are going in my mind. Well, even if I did one a day, maybe it wouldn't be as bad. It's just like one hour, but I can tell that instead I'm focusing on what is the video for the next day? What am I passionate about? I read a book. I was reading last night more than I read in a long time learning new things. I can tell that that affects things differently, but it, it does require a certain amount of focus. I have a buddy of mine that's like a breathwork practitioner, um, his name's Steven, and I can tell that he, he's, I, can, I can see what he's going through right now because he's like in the excitement of get, getting momentum. He's doing like these breathwork trainings and stuff, and he's like starting to get to another level. Uh, and I can tell he's excited. He's got all of his energy going to it. It reminds me of where I was back in 2017 because it does require a lot of energy. He's like, I was, I went on vacation for two days and I just wanted to get back to work. That's how I was. I'm not saying that that's like, it's okay to go on vacation and enjoy yourself. But when you love what you do, it's like, you just want it. You want to put your energy there. And when I love, like I'm, I'm getting back to making videos and I can tell I'm enjoying it again. The key though, for you creating your dream reality is to stop dopamine dumping your, your, your energy into television shows, alcohol, drugs, and stuff like that. So that your energy is more pure and to start putting it towards the, and to start, that's the first thing. Just simply start, start taking action, start, ask that person out, start putting yourself out in new situations, start, uh, making YouTube videos, start creating that art, start, just start. And you figure it out as you go, the blocks will come up and then stop believing the old blocks. Stop believing in their validity, let them go, and then realize that as you let them go, everything begins to change. What if I told you that there's this kind of weird manifestation technique that works, but you're gonna have to think about things in a little bit different way, but if you just did this, it would make it way more probable that you would attract what you want into your life, and it would make it also much easier and much more enjoyable. Well, this weird manifestation technique is what I use to, in a way, manifest this house. And I, I'll be honest with you guys, I'm not the biggest fan of the word manifest because of a lot of times what it implies and what I see it does. I know for me, for a long time, I was intending to manifest, you know, going full time on YouTube and manifest uh, different things in my life. And I was also confusing the word manifest with just thinking. And rather than being, being in alignment, being in the vibration of it. So manifest for me, and even the word Manny, I think Manny actually means hands, which I think, which means taking action as well. <laughs> but there's, there is a, a part of non-doing where you can vibrationally allow things into your life. And it's what I use to get this house, which is very synchronous. And I wanna explain that story with you and pretty much how I have moved into every house that I've had over the last five years. I've used this exact technique and you can use it for getting an alignment. You can use it for manifesting a relationship, for manifesting money, abundance, whatever. It's a little bit weird, 
but it really works. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about that right now. Welcome back to another video. My name is Aaron and I help people expand their consciousness. And in this video, I wanna to explain to you the story behind how I manifested this house right here. Can you see it? It's this house right here. It's a beautiful, I love this house. Um, just moved in like four or five days ago. And what I wanted to do is just kind of share the process to this because it's kind of, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of transitioning happening in the world right now, I think for a lot of people. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. I know coming out here, I'm in Austin, Texas now, before I was in Sedona, Arizona, not that long ago. And Sedona felt right in the moment, but there was something that I guess kind of felt like that was missing for me. And then there was this like aspect of myself where I try to control things and I'm trying to figure it all out. And I'm feeling resistance and feeling uncertain of like, you know, like being in the unknown sometimes feels scary or feels like, you know, something I want, I want to gain certainty. And there was a part of me that for a while was trying to figure out what is the next move in a way. Like here's, here's how invested I was as well. But I want to share with you a little bit about how this whole story went down with how I moved here because it'll, it'll also give you that weird manifestation technique that I've used many times before. So basically what happened is uh, back in January, I bought a house in Sedona. I bought this house that I had to renovate and I got it at a good time. I got this house. I put like literally $200,000 into it to renovate it, to make it look completely different. And there was a whole bunch of like also little hiccups that came up with the house as well. Like it needed pretty much, I had an inspection on it and everything, but for some reason they didn't catch a lot of things in the inspection that they should have. And it needed like a whole new roof. It needed like, there were like rodents that went into the crawl space and I had to like get that fixed, which cost like six to $8,000. I had to get and spend $8,200 on what something called a grinder pump. This thing that like grinds up the water to go down to the sewer because that went out. So there was like flooded, you know, the, the sewer system wasn't working properly. And then I had the whole kitchen remodeled, granite, bath, master bathroom was redone. Just so much cool stuff. And I got the house looking pretty much my ideal house. Um, I had an interior designer that came in that interior designed the whole house. And anybody that came over would have been, was like, this is like an amazing energy, an amazing space. I mean, I put my crystals, I have a whole bunch of crystals I put and gridded around the whole entire house. And it just had this perfect vibe. And I moved in um, pretty much like February of 20, you know, this year, and it felt great. And what I then found is that after, you know, about a month or two, it kind of felt like something was missing. And then I'm wondering like, is this like a personality thing? Like is something missing because like I always need new stimulation? And it made me really kind of go within to think about it. But basically what I realized is that being in Sedona is a magical place. I used to go to Sedona from Vegas every like three or four months. And every time I'd go, I'd get activated. And then I would go back and it would like help take me to the next level. And even Sedona, Arizona, that's where they, uh, back in the day, they would go for plant medicine. The tribes would go for like plant medicine to do inner work and then they'd go back to wherever they, they were. But what I found is living in Sedona is amazing, it's beautiful. But this next phase of what I'm doing is I wanna be doing you know, live events, I wanna be um, traveling a lot and being in Sedona, I had to travel two hours to the airport. Um, there were many aspects of it that just weren't vibing as much as I thought, but I was already so invested because I put all this money into it, bought a house, all of these things. So it didn't make sense for me to, you know, kind of look somewhere else, but I had this strong feeling that either Miami or Austin was going to be a place that I was going to like find, you know, that it would be like a next chapter or I was going to do both. I was going to go back and forth between Sedona and some other place. And then what happened is I had a lot of friends moving to Austin and Austin, Texas. And I used to think Austin was going to be like this like deserty place. And I'm like, man, I want to get out of the desert and finally came here to Austin and was going to go to Austin and then come back and feel it out and then go to Miami to come back and feel it out. And also tax is a part of it as well. <laughs> State income tax and Arizona is much more, is, is, uh, much more than that of, um, you know, where I'm from, which is Las Vegas or, you know, Texas or Miami in Florida. So this is something I was thinking about, but basically what happened is I was going to, um, went to Austin immediately from coming here. I felt like this is the place I'm meant to be. There's just something about it, some activating energy here. There's a lot of, uh, the gyms out here. Are amazing. The, there's so much nature out here. It's unbelievable. Um, the vibe out here of the houses was cool. Like I just loved everything about it, the food. And I just knew immediately. And then what happened is I was out here for five, four or five days. 
I, the last day I was here, I was like, uh, I know I'm supposed to be out here and I want to start looking at places. And I already had some real estate people shit sending me places like MLS listings and stuff to, uh, to rent, not to buy. And I kind of felt like I was going to buy, but I felt like I wanted to rent because the market here is so crazy for buying right now. But what happened is I ended up going to, um, I ended up having my assistant look really hardcore for like different places for me to see so that the last two days I was here, I go look at houses because I wanted to find something quickly because I just knew and when you know, you know. So I was looking at different houses, didn't really see anything I liked that was crazy. And then what happened is I was invited to a dinner party. So this is dinner party with all these friends. There, there was probably 30 people there. And at this dinner party, I go to uh, with a friend of mine and I meet a lot of cool people. And one of the people I met there, I was telling him how I loved Austin. I can't wait to move here and I'm going to be moving here soon. And to find out that there's a guy there that has a house that he wants to rent out. That's a mile away from this house that I'm in right now, which is this house. And he's like, I'm going to be renting out uh, my house and I want to rent to a friend and I'm going to rent it for cheaper to a friend just cause I don't want random person in my house. And he was going to rent me this house for cheaper than like this house on the market would easily go for way, thousands of dollars more than what I'm paying per month. But he gave it to me for cheaper because he wants somebody that he, you know, wants in the, the house that he kind of knows of or knows, you know, so making this new friend, it was kind of cool and it just seems so synchronous, right? Well, what ends up happening is, it just, I, he shows me photos of this house. I immediately knew. I then came and saw it right after that dinner party uh, with a friend because there's like a lockbox thing on it, uh, you know, for, um, to get in. I come in, I immediately know. And what then happens is I then, uh, he then decides that he says that he has either a friend that's going to buy the house from him in like six months, but if his friend doesn't buy it, then potentially I could buy it. And it then opened up this thing to where what happened is synchronistically, what I had to do is I had to let go of control because the day before finding this house at the dinner party, I was trying to force things to happen. I was trying really hard to get like things to fall into place. And then I was like, you know what? I just got to let go. And I was even talking to my friend, Anna, and she was like, Aaron, you know that in two, in three weeks when you come back, that's when you're supposed to find the house or figure it out. Stop trying to force it right now. You know that? And I was like, yeah, I do. I let go and then go to a dinner party. And then I meet somebody that not only wants to rent me their house, but rent it to me during the process of while I'm going through like the paperwork right now to buy the house. And he's given me the house for like pretty much market value in any house in Austin right now that's getting to the market. There's a bidding war and people are paying like cash, hundred thousand dollars over asking price. It's crazy. And I get to buy it off market. I get to buy it from a friend. I get to buy it pretty much at the, the price of what it's worth. It's crazy. And I love this house. It's in the perfect location. Everything worked well. But one thing I did when I realized I started to like the house is I started to kind of put it on a pedestal. I've done this. This is the weird manifestation technique that works like magic. What you do is you lessen the importance. I've talked about decrease importance. Anything you make really important, you create resistance around. But what I do is I imagine that this house and Austin in general wants me to live here. It sounds like this egotistical thing, like, oh, it wants you to live here. But what I think of is I think of all the people I'm able to help. You know, there's this universal collective consciousness that we're all connected to. So what we can do is we can know that the more we're in pure alignment with ourselves, the more value we add to other people, the more the universe brings you more amazing things because you're remaining in authenticity and in alignment. So what I've done before is because back in Vegas, I remember I was going for a house that had a lot of competition. There were like eight other people that were trying to get, you know, that wanted this house. And I got the house out of everyone else because I tapped into and I, one, saw the house as wanting me to live there. I thought of all the things that I could do and how I could create amazing content. But also I tapped into something that's called inner intention, which means that I tapped into the intention of the person that was renting me the house. What is their intention? Their intention was to have someone that takes care of the house, somebody that's clean, somebody that respects the house. So I sent them a letter and I wrote them a letter that says, Hey, I know there's a lot of other people that want to live in this house. I just want you to know that I work from home and it's very important that I am in a house that I really feel inspired by and your house is so inspiring and so, uh, such a nice open layout. And also I don't have, you know, I'm not like someone that has parties and all this stuff all the time. I'm very focused on what I'm doing and I languaged it with their inner intention which then allowed it to align even more. So I did the same thing with this house. I imagine that not only Austin wants me to live here, but in a way this house is just so conducive to this next stage of my life for me to add value, to make content, to make videos. 
And because I tap into that, it then decreases the importance. It decreases things being on a pedestal and it allows for more alignment. And that's why when you talk about manifestation as well, manifestation to me also like implies hands because Manny, Manny means hands, like the, the, the root of it. So hands, control, think of control. Well, think of when you're in alignment, you don't have to control. When you're in alignment and you're following your passion and you let go of outcome, that's where the magic is. I let go of outcome because even the other person that wanted to buy this house, which is like his best friend, his business partner or something, I was like, you know what? I let go of outcome. I don't need to try to control this. Whatever's meant to happen will happen if I'm meant to have this house. But at the same time, there was an intention there of wanting it. So it's letting go of control is an aspect of this, but something that makes it easy to let go of control is realizing that this thing also wants you. It's almost giving it, like realizing everything is energy. If you're trying to manifest a relationship, as much as you want the relationship for yourself, imagine there's somebody else that you would add value to, somebody else that would, would love for you to be around them. You see, then you're tapping into their inner intention. So this is kind of a weird manifestation technique, but I found that it works magical because it helps us to decrease importance to also get in alignment. So here I am in Austin now, been in this house for like four or five days, and it's all a part of this alignment and following it, even when it doesn't make sense. It didn't make much sense on paper. I'm so invested there. But then I found out as well that the house that I bought in Sedona, I bought for a certain price. It's worth like way more than what I paid with the renovations that I put into it. So even though I put 200 into it, it's worth like way more. So I'm making money and then putting that into this house. And then it just, it just worked beautifully. Cause I was going to go back and forth, but I, I'm realizing I want simplicity in my life now. But the key to this process is letting go of outcome, but also knowing that what you want wants you. And, and, and it's about also seeing what are you willing to like give in a way that adds value to the collective. Are you in alignment with your purpose, with your vision? In this episode, I'm gonna show you the number one most effective way to manifest more money into your life, period. Out of all the thousands of videos that I've made, many hundred of them have been on manifesting abundance. And I've seen, not only in my own life, but in other people's life, what is it that makes all the difference? What helps you to release the blocks that you have around abundance and money that's keeping you maybe in a certain comfort zone of playing small. Maybe you feel like there's uh, there's certain beliefs you have about money. You feel like you have worry and fear around that of money that's keeping you in a certain box from experiencing what you really want in your life. Well, in this episode, I'm gonna show you exactly how to release that and what makes all the difference when it comes to manifesting more abundance that makes the process easier than ever and allows you to really be also in more alignment so that you enjoy the process as well. Welcome back to another episode on the Aaron Dowdy podcast. My name is Aaron Dowdy, and today we're looking at that of understanding money and abundance in a completely different way. Now, one thing that I did is I went through and I looked at my own life, the timeline, especially from 2012 when I first went through my spiritual awakening. And at the time I was working my nine to five job of selling women's shoes. And uh, I can see then when I certain had certain realizations, there were certain books that I read about money that completely changed my life. And I'll share with you what those are. But then also fast forward, because I learned some of it, I applied it towards my sales commission job. But then in 2017, when I went full time on YouTube and I started making videos, um, I can see that I used the same principles and techniques then that then put me on a new trajectory to where then everything changed. And then even months after I went full time, I went from, I think making, you know, when I first went full time, I went from working my sales job, selling women's shoes, making like 60,000 a year. And after I quit that, I then was making about 60 K a year, uh, making videos about the same. There's a certain self image, like a set point that I had where everything was on autopilot. But then what happened is, uh, everything exponentialized and grew because of one little thing that I did that I'm going to be sharing with you. And it has to do with understanding money in a completely different way from what we've been taught about money and, um, why we've been stuck in the patterns that we have been in up until now. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, first off, let me share with you one thing that made all the difference in the world. 
especially when I had that nine to five job. Now to give context, having the nine to five job, selling women's shoes, I wasn't the most passionate about it, but at the same time, every single day I went in, I could start, I would start at $0 for the day and I would only get paid if I sold shoes. I got paid 10% commission of everything I sold. So if I sold $2,000 worth of shoes, I'd get paid $200. And that was cool because out of high school, I got that job um, about a year or two after working at Nordstrom Rack. Then I transferred to the full line store where I got paid much better. And um, I was making like 30, 40 bucks an hour, 20, 30, 40 bucks an hour as like a 19 year old. That was kind of crazy. All my friends were making like 10 bucks an hour back then. And I'm like, it was, it was pretty cool. The cool thing about this though, was every day I went in, I started at zero. And as I was started learning the law of attraction, and as I started to like read different books, I could see what really worked and what really didn't work. I could see that if I went in and I had a certain vision for what I wanted to like sell that day, there'd be, it would depend on my energy and it would depend on certain things that I would do to what kind of results that I got. Now, one of the biggest things that changed everything for me with two different things that I learned. The first one was from the book, Think and Grow Rich. The book, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. He has one little sentence in there that really changed a lot for me. It was this one thing, go the extra mile, go the extra mile. Now I'm also going to be some of this stuff you probably heard me talk about in this episode before in prior videos. I'm going to bring in a concept I have not talked about in a long time that will really clarify a lot of this for you, but it, it's similar. And I'll show you the tie to the whole going the extra mile thing when we talk about the energetics of this, but going the extra mile means going above and beyond giving more than other people that are maybe giving in your field. If you were to do this one thing, this is what would change everything when it comes to you getting maybe uh, a promotion at your job, you getting job offers. When I had this mentality while selling women's shoes, I got offered jobs more than any other time uh, when I was working that job is when I would do this one thing and it's go the extra mile. Now, what did this mean? Well, first off, I'm selling women's shoes, right? Well, what I would do is I would go the extra mile. I would do little things that like a lot of people would overlook. One of them is I would have the bag, put the bags in the, the shoe, like the Nordstrom bag, and I would put tissue over it. I would have a little bit more attention to detail when I was like being mindful that they were buying like, you know, a hundred or 200 to $500 pair of shoes. I remember one time, by the way, this guy came, uh, this guy that I worked with, what was his name? I don't even remember. I think his name was like a Daryl or something like that. And um, he came from Dillard's and Dillard's had kind of like a rep for being more of a sales like rack place. Like they always had sales going on like all the time, all day, every day. And this guy comes and he's working uh, in the same department at me in Brass Plum Shoes and, and Nordstrom's. And I remember one time a, he was helping a customer and he like, he took all the tissue out of the box threw away the tissue and then just put the shoes in the box, clamped up the box, put it in a bag and gave it to her. And she was like, so offended, you know, it was like a, a hundred dollar pair of shoes, but like it, it was cause the way he was treating it was like garbage. Like, and I remember thinking like, this isn't Dillard's anymore, bro. <laughs> People also going to Nordstrom's had a certain perspective because Nordstrom's was known for customer service. They were known for going above and beyond. They were known for like doing crazy things. They're also known for their return policy. So they'd return everything. Even if it was like, you know, a year later, they would do a return on it, which wasn't always the best for the sales employees there, by the way, because you know, the sales employees would sell these shoes and then somebody would return them like a year later because they, even though they were warned because they decided that they could do that. And then the salesperson still gets hit with the return. So it's kind of shitty, <laughs> uh, side note. But I remember that that mentality, that energy didn't vibe as well because it wasn't, I don't know, there wasn't that much thoughtfulness. It wasn't going above and beyond when that Dillard's guy did that. So I started to eventually do the opposite where I started to go above and beyond. I would go above and beyond to like make sure and like bring out other shoes I thought they would like. And I would, I just, uh, I'd like offer them water and I would do all this stuff that some other people didn't do. And immediately from doing this, I started selling more. People thought that I, you know, people could feel that I really cared. Um, there was more authenticity there and I'd get more job offers from other places because I was going above and beyond. I was going the extra mile. 
Now, this will set you apart from other people you work with. This will set you apart from, um, if you own your own business, from other companies. I also use this, by the way, and we'll talk about the dynamics of this, of why this energy works as well in a second with the new concept I've I haven't talked about in, I think, years, but I brushed upon it recently and it made all the difference. But even when I started making YouTube videos, when I started making videos, I started looking at there was also a self-worthiness thing when I started making videos because I, I looked at like Ralph Smart, Teal Swan, all these other creators. And what I noticed is that, you know, I thought that them making videos of just talking to the camera, just like, you know, just like in front of a camera, it was like, they're doing that, that works for them, but that won't work for me because I had such a, a low level of, a low level of self-worth that I felt that I had to like add in crazy cool editing. I had to do all this extra stuff so that people would watch because at, in the beginning at least, I just didn't believe that people would really just watch me for me. So that was something else I had to become aware of. But when I started making videos on YouTube, one thing that made it easier is I made it less about me and I made it more about the other. How, I, how can I add value to other people? So I would add value and think, well, what videos would help people to like, you know, um, shift their life. I was making videos on the law of attraction. I was making videos uh, on reprogramming the subconscious mind. I would then see from videos what resonated most with people, what they wanted more of. And I would just keep focusing on adding value and adding more value than anyone else I've seen done. And that's how I, I treated it is this isn't about me. This is about adding value. And even when I had that nine to five job, if I went in selling shoes and it was all about me and my paycheck, then people would feel that off of me and they would feel that I was trying to use them as a customer to get me closer to my goals. But if I went in and I want to add value, they would feel that and it would then have the side effect of more money. So that's another point I want to make here. Money is a side effect, not the end result. You never want to focus on the money. On YouTube, you never want to focus on the subscribers and getting more subscribers or the views. You don't want to focus on those things. You want to focus on the energy. And that's what money is. Money is energy. And money is a reflection of the energy you are putting out into the world. So when I make YouTube videos, if I make YouTube videos with the intention of adding value and I do it in an engaging way and I focus on that, then guess what? There's going to be more, this stuff comes anyways, the views, the value, the people sticking around, like that all comes as a result of that. But if you lead with, and you make videos to get views, they, those videos never get the views. If you are going and helping customers just based on like, if they're going to buy or not, and like, are they going to add value to you? You will create a lot of resistance. And many times people won't buy because they'll feel that energy. Some of the best days I had were the days I went in with the intention of adding value, but also of having fun. That's another thing. My girlfriend just called me yesterday and she was talking about her vlogs. She vlogs on YouTube and she loves doing it. And she was telling me the videos that do the best for me are the videos that I'm enjoying the most. And she's like, I have to like get out of this mode of like, she's realizing that she just has to enjoy it more for it to do better or for it to like her and Eve to even enjoy it more. And it's a win-win too. When I was going into that nine to five job, if I was enjoying and having fun helping customers, they would buy. It's an emotional thing. It's like, if I just have fun, the more fun I had, the more money I made. The more fun I have making these podcast episodes, the more, the better they do. You could probably feel it in this episode. I have a lot of energy and I feel really lit up right now. And you probably feel that. People feel what you feel. And if you are feeling and you're having fun, you will manifest more abundance and more energy. Now there's this other idea I want to share with you. So going the extra mile is key. That changed everything. Realize that you're always getting a reflection of what you believe you deserve. That's where we get into the second aspect of this with the new concept I want to share. The next thing is I read a book. So Think and Grow Rich was one book I read, completely changed my life. There's another book. What is it called? It's called The Science of Getting Rich by Walter Waddles. Is that the name of it? I think that's the name of it. It's a 50 page book. I would read that book every single day going into my at Nordstrom's. I would go to the E bar, which is like their little bar or like the little coffee bar. I would get an espresso or a coffee. I would go sit at the E bar and I would read in my little iPhone. Cause this is back in 2011 when the iPhones were much smaller. I would read, think I would read uh, that uh, the science of getting rich. 
And there was a video I used to watch also with Wayne Dyer on the power of intention. I remember very clearly, I would like, I would just read these all the freaking time. If you've ever seen Bob Proctor, he's always talking about, you know, reading the book, Think and Grow Rich. He's like, it's in my back pocket. I'm reading it right now. Like I'm talking to you right now, but I'm reading about it. I'm thinking about it. Like he's always reading the book, Think and Grow Rich because that repetition is helping rewire his brain. So for me, that was kind of like this science of getting rich book, but it, a lot of it talked about, it talked about impression and impressing what's called increased value, increasing value, giving value, going the extra mile is very similar. But one of the other books I read that changed everything was Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz. It's a doctor. This guy wrote a book because he realized that when he, as a plastic surgeon, had clients that were coming in to get facial reconstruction and like, you know, boob jobs, facelifts, all this stuff, the only way they would really create internal change, internal happiness, is if they also changed their self-image. Everyone has a self-image that's on autopilot. We will do anything we can to stay within the set point of that self image. We will fight for it to stay the same, even if it means pain. And what like, so he'd have someone that would get a facial surgery, but they would not feel any different unless they also changed their internal self image. And that's what, um, like that's what inspired him to learn more about this whole inner self image thing. So for me, working that nine to five job, going in, you know, at the E-bar, reading about the science of getting rich and all this other stuff, when I read Psycho-Cybernetics, everything changed because I became brutally honest and aware of my self-image. I saw myself as an average sales employee. Now, first off, let's not get too far ahead of it. First question you want to ask yourself is what is my internal self-image? How do I see myself? What is my money set point? We all like I made working that sales job always 55 to 65,000 a year. That was my set point. There were some people I worked with that made 70, 80,000 a year because it was a sales job, right? I could have made that, but I didn't. Why not? Because my self image was the 55 to 65K a year. That was my comfortable set point. And what happened is the first question I asked myself is what is my set point? And I said, well, how much am I making? So you, you can actually use your external reality to show you what your current set point is, what your current natural uh, point is. And what you can then do is realize that that is where you are and you can be honest with yourself. And I thought to myself, well, you know, at the end of the day, you go home, you come back the next day at the sales job, and there is a list of the top sales employees from the day before by department. So I could see that I was always right in the middle of this list. There's a guy named Tony. He was always at the top. He was like, you know, selling shoes for a long time, and he was, he was good at it. There were two or three other people that were always at the top, and then there was this middle lit part. And there was the bottom part. And I would only be at the top if I had a lucky day, a lucky day. And then the people at the bottom were kind of always at the bottom. And I realized, oh, that's interesting. It's con there's consistency there. What is it? And I, I, I realized I see myself as a mediocre employee. I see myself as an average sales employee. And this is what I did. I started becoming aware of that. I started asking myself, what would the top salesperson version of Aaron think, feel, and act like, and be. What is my body language like? How would I greet customers? Would I greet every customer or only select customers? What kind of energy would I lead with? Would I smile or not smile? What would that version of me, um, how would I express myself? How would I add value? How would I go above and beyond? And then what I did is I simply decided this is who I am now. Within days, I was consistently at the top of that list by changing my internal self image and then being it, giving myself permission to be that version of me. And I used that. And from that point going forward, my job was much easier. And I had a base point with one going above and beyond, which we'll talk about something in a minute that will, I think, tie all of this together because it's, it's tied in with all of this. But then I applied that same exact principle because then I went, I learned that and then I ended up working at Barty's New York, which is a more expensive shoe department. And then in 2017, I used that same principle to become a full-time YouTuber. Working that nine to five job, going in 40 hours a week, I was like, what would the full-time version Aaron YouTuber be doing every single day? 
I'd be making a video. I'd be consistently making videos. I'd be adding value. I'd be learning marketing. I'd be learning how to like get more dynamic on camera. I'd be like putting in the reps. And then I started being that version of me. And guess what happened? Within six months, uh, I was full-time on YouTube. I put in my two weeks. One of the best feelings I've ever had is putting in my two weeks and not being told by corporate politics what to do. And, and my manager, it was like, a, it was such a good feeling. And even then I went full-time and then there was another jump that I had. And all these jumps, they came from me changing my self image and giving myself permission to be this new version of me. But there's a tie, there's a, there's a thing here I want to share when it comes to money and abundance and this like whole effective way thing. And it has to do with what is called surplus energy, surplus energy. This is what changed everything for me. And this was allowed me to really create that abundance. Now surplus energy, what this means is there's an energy that we all have. That's our base point energy of how we're thinking, feeling, and acting that's on autopilot. And even when you're going to the gym, think about it in the gym analogy, you go to the gym every day and you just do the same weights every single day. You're not going to get bigger because you're not challenging your muscle to grow. You're not breaking down the tissue to allow it to grow. So what I've been doing to get bigger in the gym is I've been going in, I've been pushing myself beyond what is comfortable. And by doing that, it then grows more. Well, the same thing happens with energy surplus. What you must do in order to create more abundance, more money, more anything is realize your base necessities being meet your survival mode, right? Going into work, doing in the same things every day, not going the extra mile, just doing the baseline minimum that will keep you where you are. But then what you do is you realize that you have something called surplus energy. When you are passionate about what you're doing, that's adding value into the world. That's your surplus energy. Where are you putting your surplus energy? Now, some of you may be putting your surplus energy into playing video games. You may be putting your surplus en energy into just watching videos. You may be putting your surplus energy into bad habits, alcohol, uh, cannabis, like just completely losing yourself in other things. And that's where your surplus energy is going. The key to this is being aware of where your surplus energy is going and then putting it into things that you are passionate about that also add value out into the world. That's what changes everything. And then you can also become aware of some of the beliefs you have about money and abundance that are keeping you where you are because that comfort zone, that set point is what you will fight to stay consistent to. I was fighting to stay consistent to a nine to five job. I wasn't passionate about, but I felt very safe with that job. And it was like, even though I didn't enjoy it, it was like, it brought in the money every month. It felt normal. It felt like average, you know? So this is something you want to become aware of when it comes to where you're putting your energy and this whole idea of surplus energy. And then also the blocks that you have, the blocks, a lot of the blocks you have come from parental and family dynamics growing up. If you have fear and worry about money, let me ask you a question. Did you have a parent or a family member that also had fear and worry about money? Because if so, then you may have taken on their meaning to money that is having you block it in your life now. Now, one thing we will be doing in the 21 day magnetic abundance challenge that starts on January 1st, if you haven't joined yet, go to aaron slash money is we're going to be going through 21 days of reforming our relationship and our beliefs about money to really align with our true selves. And it's going to look like by the way that you join this and that it's all about money and abundance, but it's actually more so to do with the shadow of what you learned growing up from your parents, your family, your sense of worthiness, because you will always get a reflection of what you believe you deserve. And as you confront this, that's where money starts to flow into your life. We've like, we've not given ourselves permission to be the most bold, authentic, abundant version of ourselves. And that's why we feel blocked. That's why we feel stuck. So, Right now is the best time to join. If you haven't joined already, by the way, it's aaron.com slash money, but surplus energy is really the key to this, the name of this game because surplus energy is also going above and beyond going the extra mile. The way I would tissue up things and go above and beyond, add more value. The way I make videos that add value and that's the intention. And even now I'm realizing that I enjoy making these videos, but I enjoy more so doing like live events. I might just start doing like more interviews or videos with different people to challenge myself. But also I think that might just add more value and I'm more excited about it. Remember this people feel what you feel when I was selling women's shoes. If I was having a day that I didn't feel that great, I wouldn't do as well. 
If I was enjoying the process of having fun, I would do better. If I was making a video and I'm enjoying making the video, you can feel that energy. You can feel that surplus energy just oozing out and then it's like contagious. And then those videos tend to do better. But we, the trap we don't want to get caught up in is focusing on the side effect, which is the money and the views and the significance and all this stuff. We want to focus on the energy. Where's your energy alignment happening? Are you passionate about what you're doing? When you're passionate about it, you're also adding value to other people. Now, the other thing you want to do is you want to bring awareness to different aspects of your beliefs and your meanings that you give to money because that will block money from coming into your life. For a long time, in 2012, when I went through my awakening, go through my awakening in 2012, I said, screw money. It's evil. It's control. And I ended up just quitting my nine to five job at Nordstrom's on a whim. And I didn't want to get a nine to five job. And from there, what I did is I lived at my mom's and I was just meditating. I just wanted to ascend into a higher level of consciousness. I was sun gazing. I got really dark. Actually, I got really skinny because I went vegan on a whim. And then I also, and I was like, just looking, I had just, honestly, I started looking unhealthy. Um, kind of like stopped eating a lot. I was kind of depressed as well. I, I wasn't depressed. I was actually excited because of my spiritual awakening, but then I was like sun gazing every day for hours a day. And I got really dark. Um, and, but then I also developed a belief that like money is control and all this stuff. And guess what? You think I attracted a lot of money in? Nope. All my energy was going towards the, the system and how bad it is and how like it's not in alignment, all this stuff. And guess what happened? I was not attracting abundance and money in. I had to look at and realize that if I believe money is bad, then to get money means I'm bad. I had to look at the beliefs that money is the root of all evil. To be spiritual and have money doesn't make sense. That was, I had to look at all this stuff. Now realize being spiritual, you can be spiritual and be abundant at the same time because everything is a reflection of us. Everything is a reflection of our own energy and money is just one version of that. You don't have to get lost or overly identified with the money, but at the same time, realize that we came here to have a physical experience. We came here to enjoy the food, to enjoy nice things. And the more we focus on that, the more that changes everything is we focus on allowing ourselves to actually enjoy this experience. How good can things get for you? There's another book called the upper, it's called, um, the big leap. The upper limit problem is what it's called. And the thing is, is we have a certain base point of what we feel. And anytime things start getting really good, we start looking for reasons to sabotage ourselves. Anytime like somebody, you know, might, you might experience that if you're like in a loving relationship or something, someone starts to like you and you're like, this feels weird. I need to fuck this up somehow. You see what I mean? It's like, and, and these are based in four different things that we're going to be going through, by the way, in the 21 day magnetic abundance challenge. But one of them is we believe we're flawed. There's some level of shame that we have around money. Something broken about me it normally comes from childhood dynamics and family growing up. I was treated a certain way by my ex stepmom. There's something wrong with me. Why would this happen? Why would my dad protect me from my ex stepmom? I must be broken. Shame. No one could really love me. That was, those are beliefs that I had. And then I was like, you know, blocking me from abundance because I, I couldn't even get the courage to like make videos because why would anyone ever listen to me? The second one is like a, a an abandonment. We're afraid people are going to leave us. How can you make more money if you're afraid you're going to leave your family and friends in the dust? You're going to become this egocentrical asshole that just like ditches everybody. That's the belief we might have. And we're afraid then to do that. Maybe we're afraid of outshining other people. That's another one of them. Maybe growing up, you had siblings growing up to where if you got the attention, you'd feel bad for other siblings. That was me. I felt bad for my brother. And I'd always like deflect energy. So I couldn't deflect any compliments or, you know, any level of praise wasn't worthy of it also, you know, many of us will have a combination of these. In other words, we don't want to be a burden. We don't want to be a burden to the world, to other people. So like why even try, right? These are all different aspects, but the, the way to manifest money more effectively than ever before is to focus on your own energy, not on the money and on giving what is called having the surplus energy funneled into what you're passionate about with going the extra mile, and, and adding value, finding creative ways to add value. If you were to go over to my YouTube channel right now, type in manifesting love Aaron Doughty. 
what you would see is you would see probably two to 500 videos on attracting love. And a lot of those were based in some of the old school philosophies. If you want to attract something, then do X, Y, Z. This is the energy dynamic of it, blah, blah, blah. Now, here is a video for you. I think it's the last video you really have to watch on this. And it is the most effective and powerful way of attracting love and manifesting love when really it's a kind of a counterintuitive thing because manifesting love and attracting love is bullshit. What I mean by bullshit is I mean it is not the stereotypical way that we think about it. where we are attracting something from outside inside. It comes from the inside out and it has to do with looking or finding a reflection, but not looking, finding a reflection of the love that you already have in yourself. I have a YouTube meditation, meditation on YouTube that has over, I think, 4 million views now. It's my most powerful meditation, most popular meditation. And there's thousands of comments in there from people saying that they've manifested love from listening to that meditation for 21 days. One of the reasons I believe that is, is because what that meditation does is it has people focus on how they feel and of seeing themselves as someone that's worthy of love, but also of tapping into that energy of feeling it from the inside out. If you want to check out that meditation, click below and then also read the comments. When you read the comments, it increases the belief in the process. And when I look at the process of attracting love, it is not of bringing something into your life. It is not of doing something a little bit different. You know, what is the one technique that you can use? How can you see something a little bit differently or say the right thing when you're dating or texting someone? It has nothing to do with that. This is what it actually has to do with. And I'm going to share with you that in this video. Now, first off, attracting love is bullshit. It is bullshit. Bullshit. Attracting love is not something that we attract. It is something that is reflected. It is reflected back to us depending on how much inner self love we feel inside of our bodies. And like that meditation I was telling you about, it's because you're feeling the love inside your body that it makes it easier for new reflections to happen in your life. But when we are searching for something on the outside, then what we're doing is we're projecting our energy on the outside and we're looking for something that is outside of us. It is like the book, The Alchemist. You guys ever read that book? It's like this guy goes all around the world looking for some type of treasure. He's looking for treasure to find out the treasure was in his freaking backyard the whole time. But he was looking for it outside. So the thing that I want to share with you is that attracting love is bullshit because you're trying to find something outside of yourself. And when you're trying to find it outside of yourself, you're going to find someone that is an equal reflection of that energy dynamic. You're going to find somebody that's also looking for love outside of themselves, which means they haven't completely integrated inside their body and felt 100% worthy, whole and complete. Now, when we talk about attracting love, this is a, I believe, more effective way of going about it because what is happening is there is a subconscious block, block, I like to say block like that. There's a subconscious block around a finding, finding love because you're looking for it on the outside, but also not just because you're looking for it on the outside. There's a block there because probably there's some type of childhood trauma or something that's blocking you from feeling that unconditional love that's within yourself. And what I'm learning in my own life is that there's certain experiences from childhood. Some people call these attachment styles. There's attachment styles, there's anxious attachment, there's avoidant attachment, there's secure attachment. These are all different attachment styles that are primed and were developed when we were a kid from the way we related to our parents. Anxious means we lean in to find love and we, we try to get something out of somebody else and uh, it's like we don't feel that love already so we chase it. That's why whatever you chase, you're implying something's running away. When you look at avoidant, it's Avoidant people push it away. So anxious lean in, avoidance push out. And the way the reason they push it out is because at some point in their past, there was some level of trust that was broken and then they're now afraid of it. So they want love, but they want to keep it where they want to keep it and they don't want it to get too close. It's this weird kind of like push pull thing. That's why a lot of times anxious attachment, avoidant attachments tend to attract each other because it's that glue. And the secure attachment, Congratulations, it pretty much means that you're like equal of both. But, and some people could, I guess, switch back and forth based on the polarity. I've had a like woman I've dated before that were way more anxious and that made me avoidant. It gets a little bit whatever. But 
that is all rooted from a childhood trauma, from some type of childhood experience where you either said it's not safe and then you push it away or and you're afraid to get intimate or you didn't feel it and you are searching for it in other people. You didn't feel nurtured growing up, so you're searching for it. Now, the reason you're blocking love is because you haven't let go or become aware of that childhood trauma. So really the key to attracting love is first off, you're feeling the love on the inside and then getting the reflection in life, but it's all about letting go. It is letting go of prior past trauma and becoming aware of that block and allowing yourself to feel what comes up, to feel what that inner child version of you felt. And as you do, you begin to heal it. And then you begin to feel more confident within yourself too. You don't feel so freaking needy or you don't feel so much like pushing it away, pushing it away like that. So if you want to attract love, this is about getting and going to the core of your energy. You are very magnetic and attractive when you are being yourself. And you are being yourself and you're being in your body. You see, trauma also makes us exit our body. So when we go through trauma, what happens is it's like we move the energy from being inside of our, of our diaphragm and in our, in our like lower chakras. And this happens a lot with people pleasers and people that have been through spiritual awakenings. The energy leaves the bottom and goes to like almost the third eye and then you can tune to everyone else and it's all in your head or people become very heady and they're like, how do I manifest this? Or how do I, uh, what, what text message do I send? All this analytical stuff. It's about being, it's about your own energy and how attached you are. The best piece of advice I give to a lot of people looking to attract love is to just let it go. Let it go. Stop, and it's easy to say, it's like, well, I want this thing. It's not that easy, Aaron, how am I just gonna let it go? Well, yeah, how would you let it go? If you feel like somebody outside of you is gonna complete you, then of course, letting it go is like, is like saying yes to feeling incomplete or feeling empty. But when you instead turn the camera frame on you or you, you, like, you turn the scope this way and then instead you focus on doing the inner child work, healing your inner child, healing that trauma and letting go of outcome, that's when you'll start to feel that love on the inside. So that's why also they say that like, I think you find somebody that is in alignment with you when you are being the most aligned version of yourself. I say this story a lot, I know, but when I used to work a nine to five job, the girls, the girlfriends that I would have would all be people that also worked nine to five jobs they didn't like because I was working a nine to five job I didn't like. Then I started doing YouTube and I started doing what I love. Then I met and started dating women that I are also doing what they love. It's a reflection. They're a woman that were in alignment with themselves. You get a reflection in life and not, it's not about attracting something on the outside inwards. Anything you chase, you are assuming is outside of yourself. So one of the best things I think you could do is focus more on letting go than wiring in. It's like attracting love is like, how can I wire in this love? How can I wire in and attract that from over there to into here? Instead of it's, how can I let go of the belief that I'm not worthy? How can I let go of my attachment to past relationships? How can I let go to my attachment to control and trying to control something that's very divine and loving? You see, that's the difference. It's the difference is letting go will allow yourself to fill up more of what you could say like your higher self energy, more of who you're meant to be. You can then more unapologetically be yourself and then you're going to have magnetic energy and you're going to attract that to you, but really it's going to reflect that back to you because you are embodying you. You are inside of your body. So this is the biggest key, the most effective way to go about it. It is not, you know, you, you'll feel blocked and you won't know why, or you'll attract somebody because there's some, there's maybe some subconscious trauma that you haven't felt before. Maybe there's certain memories that you've suppressed based on childhood trauma that you're not aware of. But how do you become aware of those? You start, I'd say go into meditation and start inquiring about these different things. You don't have to always dial in on the exact moment, the exact perspective, everything. But when you start bringing the energy inside of your body, you'll see that sometimes this stuff starts coming up to the process. And then as it does, you can then let go of those blocks. When you feel it, you heal it. And those subconscious blocks, and if there's any guilt, if there's any shame, then what happens is if you're afraid to look at that or you're suppressing it or you're keeping it in this little compartment, it's like being stored inside of your body and it's blocking that love from coming into your life or you'll feel blocked in that area. It's like literally almost like a block that's in that chakra. And one of the best ways that you can go about this is, is feeling 
that energy and forgiving your past self, forgiving your, uh, your inner child, loving your inner child, letting them that you see them, you hear them, giving the inner child what you felt like you lacked growing up. And as you do that, you're gonna begin to feel differently about yourself. This is all really a game of self. All rea- you wanna go a little bit deeper? All reality is, is a reflection of the self. So when you attract someone else into your life, it's a reflection of another aspect of you. Even your friends, your family, there's a lot of, everything is a reflection of different energy dynamics. And if you want to attract love, then what you want to do is you want to turn the scope within and feel the love on the inside. Now, that is actually the key, but also healing and letting go. So this isn't about wiring in and attracting, it's more about letting go and releasing. When you let go and release, you'll find that you then are just unapologetically being yourself, you become more magnetic, and then you attract what you desire or intend for into your life. So that's the energy dynamic difference between what we're taught to do in the traditional LOA community, what I have like two to 500 videos on, plus what I'm learning to do and it's learning to go into the crevices of my own shadow, my own attachment, and to heal that, to heal the inner child inside of myself that feels neglected, feels abandoned, that feels uh, misunderstood, and to give that version of me love. And as I do, my outer reality begins to change. I become more magnetic, I feel more confident about myself, and it changes everything. To create our dream life, we must let go of who we thought we were to then wire in and let in who we actually came here to be. This is exactly when I looked to my own journey to see how I bridged the reality for me doing what I was doing, of working that nine to five job back in 2017 to doing what I love now full time. The biggest difference that I can look at to see that what I had to do is I had to let go of my beliefs about myself. I had to let go of my self image, who I believed I was. I had to let go of my attachments, uh, whether that was an attachment to the job, attachment to the people that I was hanging around, attachment to the habits that I had. I had to let go of all of those to then simply let in that which was natural for me, that which was more in alignment with the highest vibrational me. And even now, as I look at my life and things are beginning to change even more, I'm letting go of the version of Aaron that was just making YouTube videos and letting in by letting go of that. You know, even it's interesting before this episode even started sitting here for like 10, 15, 20 minutes thinking to myself, like, what could I talk about that I haven't already shared in like 2000 YouTube videos that have gone on the YouTube channel. And I literally wrote in my iPad, like new stories. It literally says new stories. And I wrote down like eight new stories of things that have happened in the last couple of weeks that I haven't shared before because there's times on YouTube or just in creating content in general, it becomes a challenge to always come up with new stuff. We always come up with new stories. You know, I have like my core story, the, not the horror story, the core story with the whole ex stepmom thing, bridging and healing my pain of the past, going through my spiritual awakening, but then going full time on YouTube. And beyond that, there's little things that happen in my life that I can share. And uh, I think what I'm letting go of too is my own belief, my own story, that some story that I share has to be some crazy monumental shift for it to be something that I do share. But anyways, I'm letting go of the YouTuber version of me and realizing that there's a, like, there's a legit guilt that I feel when I'm not making a YouTube video or when I'm not making content. I think because the saving grace for me back in 2017 was I started making daily videos and that was my saving grace out of my reality of selling woman's shoes. But before that even happened, I had to let go of the version of me and the perspective that I had around having a nine to five job because I got safety from that nine to five job and I was afraid to leave it, believe it or not, even though I knew I wasn't passionate about it. I waited six months to quit that job and I probably could have quit after three months because I, if I would have just, it's like, if you don't, if you have a block up, you won't see opportunities and things that could actually reflect back to you like an opportunity out. But for six months I was making videos 
two or three videos started to go viral, my channel started to pick up. And if I would have known what I know now, I would have gone full time in like weeks, you know, with like 5,000 subs or less, but I didn't know. So it took a while for me to get synchronicity to say, oh, I can do this. But before that, and during that time, I realized that I didn't want to make the same rash decision that I made back in 2012. So there was a fear. There was like this mechanism that was there that was keeping me from actually quitting until I was extremely secure and sure that I would make it. Because back in 2012, I worked at Nordstrom's in women's shoes and I went through a spiritual awakening and I became very ungrounded. I was convinced and you know, there were millions of people all over the world that thought this, you know, it's funny, my best friend, Victor Odo, him and I, um, we met on YouTube, but also we found out that both in 2012, we each in our own ways were convinced that the whole planet was going to ascend into a new level of consciousness. And I went through extreme amount of uh, transformation, but also there was a lot of pain that went with that. Some of that pain was, uh, literally feeling very alone in the spiritual awakening process. I had family and friends that thought I went crazy. And in a way I was very ungrounded. So I see where they got that perspective. In a moment I went vegan and it was like, I lost all this weight and started looking very, like I was on drugs or something when I wasn't, I was on nothing. I was just meditating like eight to 10 hours a day. No, not that much. I was meditating a lot though. I was doing a lot of mantras and stuff. I was like in the sun lane all the time. And, and eventually I quit my job working at Nordstrom's because it got in the way of my global meditations on Sunday that I was a part of trying to help by like just, you know, and I wasn't having a YouTube channel or anything back then. I just wanted to go and meditate. And um, it was funny, I was working at Nordstrom's and I would cross the street and go to the Trump Hotel and I would meditate in the, in the grass there. And that was my Sunday. And if I had a customer, I would like have to leave the customer or try to find a way to close it up quick with the customer. So I could go at three o'clock PM every Sunday to do this global meditation thing. So that planet could ascend into a new level of consciousness. Now, what happened though, is there were some things that shifted at work where, uh, that one manager got fired. That was very similar to my ex stepmom. She's very controlling, very manipulative. If you guys have heard my story, then you kind of know about that already. Um, or I shared that, but there was a new manager that came in that was also like very similar in a little bit different way, but basically he was corrupt. It was all politics. Uh, he actually had a crush on me and he didn't like the fact that I told him I wasn't gay. So he, you know, cause he, he kept trying to like hit on me over and over again. And I got uncomfortable. I'm like, dude, please stop. Um, and then he started retaliating and was like giving me a bad schedule and it became this whole thing. Basically I said, screw this all. And I quit on a whim and I went through months of like not having a job. I was resisting even being in the 3D world. That's how ungrounded I became. And I spent like six months not doing anything and just meditating and waiting to ascend into a higher level of consciousness. And there was a lot of pain that came with that. I was so resistant to getting back integrated into the 3D reality that I even went so far as like my, I lived at my, with my mom and she had a husband at the time that she ended up divorcing because he saw how crazy all this spiritual awakening stuff was, and he couldn't hang with it. <laughs> so um, my mom, my sister, and I moved into something called Emerald Suites, where there's, which are like these really not necessarily safe, kind of like a budget suites, kind of ghetto. A lot of people that were there were on either doing drugs, or it was like, a, it's a place you go that you pay weekly for. It's all furnished and everything, but there's these little like one bedroom apartments. I slept on the floor there, and I was so resistant to getting a job that I remember telling like my dad and other people, like, I will live in, at fucking Sunset Park before I'll get a job again. And that's how resistant I was to going back into 3D reality. So from that situation, I had such a level of ungroundedness. And eventually what happened is I, uh, I, I had to actually, uh, I know I've told this story before, so I'm sorry for those of you that have heard it and are like, oh, it's still, you said you didn't want to get to do this at the beginning of the episode and now you're doing it. But I had this um, like 80 year old lady that I would, that I met through somebody just through the phone um, she did this kinesiology muscle testing thing where you could muscle test your subconscious mind for truths, like true or false. And she was able to like pinpoint this heart wall that I had put up when I was 20 years old or 21 years old from a, a, a girlfriend that I broke up with. It was like all these things. And she was so accurate. She's had this, like this chart that she would go through and she would tell me the answer to these things. And I was like, wow, these are so accurate. And then one question I asked her was, does spirit want me to get a job? Am I meant to have a, a, like a 3d job again? 
And she got a strong yes. And I was like, no, I was like, okay, let me ask it again. And I asked it in like eight different ways. And every time she's like, no, they're pretty clear. That's I'm getting, yes, I'm getting, yes, I'm getting, yes. I'm like, ah, so I then, uh, decided to go back into the workforce, become grounded. Um, I actually moved back over with my dad and then he helped me get back on my feet and like bought me a suit and stuff. And then I, I started working and applied at Barney's New York and got the job within literally a day that I applied for it. It was crazy how synchronous it was there, but there was so much pain that was involved with the ungroundedness of that. And, and that even after I was on YouTube and I, my channel started to grow, I was afraid to quit because if I quit, maybe I'll fail again. I'll be embarrassed and I'll have like, you know, I'll lose all my friends and family. They'll think I'm, I'm weird again because I'm making these law of attraction videos, which by the way, law of attraction videos and videos on some of these esoteric concepts is very common. Now back in 2017, there weren't many people doing it. And so talking about this stuff was kind of out there, you know, there'd be, uh, which I think was a benefit to me on honestly, because there was less, I guess, like videos out there on it. So it was more desired, but in general, I had to let go of the nine to five job going version of me. And even the nine to five, uh, version of me that was like more grounded in society. Now that wasn't so weird, you know? And the, as I began to let go of that version of me, I then began to naturally feel inclined and like empowered to be the version of me that was making daily videos on YouTube. So it's a process of letting go and wiring in. And if I were to sum up by the way, transformation and my whole channel, all my teachings into two main ideas, it would be to let go and wire in. That's it. The, the letting go is about the awareness of the identity, your past, the labels, the attachments, the people that you're connected to. That's all on autopilot. You will find that you, how you think, feel, and act is on autopilot. And to let go of that, you have to let go of the reasoning and the, in a way, uh, the identification that you have with those things. So now I'm, you know, even like I looked to the, this last year or two, one of the main pieces of like inner work that I've done is on the whole nice guy thing, letting go of that version of me to then wire in a new version of me that isn't just so nice. Now, when you hear nice guy, you understand that being a nice guy is a shadow. Being a people pleaser is a shadow. And it stems from a lot of times childhood wounding where something happened in the past and we felt like we had to change our sense of self or we didn't feel safe in our own sense frame in our own sense of self. So we started tuning to others. And if we could just get their validation, then we could feel safe. If we get our parents validation when we were kids, then we could feel safe. And normally this is also a rejection wound, a, a rejection or abandonment wound as kids, either emotional abandonment or physical abandonment. But we think there's something wrong with us. It's also rooted in a degree of shame. I'm broken. Shame means I'm broken. There's a belief there that says uh, there's something wrong with me and I'm broken. Well, I had that and my dad has that still has it. To this day, my dad is the nicest guy in the world. It's funny. He's got like this compartmentalization where he loves what he does. He's extremely good at what he does. He's a fire investigator and he's very masculine in that area of his life. But in every other area of his life, it's more of that kind of, um, kind of that loss of frame and always doing things for other people. And I can tell that it's caused a lot of pain for him because he attracted my ex stepmom, who is a narcissist. And there was this big story, this big identity that I had around being similar to my dad. And because of that though, it caused my relationships to not have polarity because I would change my center of gravity based upon my partner and their energy. And what I had to learn how to do is I had to learn how to bring my energy back so I could be in my masculine frame so that the feminine could relax and also respect the masculine. And as I became aware and more and more of the shadow, I realized that the nice guy is extraordinarily manipulative. People pleasers are extraordinarily manipulative. They just don't know it. And that's because the idea is that it's an exchange. If I can be nice to you, if I can not give you tension, then you're going to like me. But the thing is, is that's not actually authentic. I had to confront and look at the old version of me. I had to let go of the nice guy, Aaron. And I also had to heal the shame and realize I'm not broken. There's no broken part of me. A lot of that too was rooted in the emotional unavailability that I experienced when I was a kid 
realizing that my mom's and dad's shit growing up, that was their stuff, not mine. It didn't mean I was broken. And my parents didn't divorce because I was broken or there's something wrong that I did. And as kids, we internalize everything. So letting go of the nice guy version of me and being this new version of me that sits in tension, has conversations that sometimes aren't easy. Over this last year, I've had a lot of very, I guess, uh, un, like, un, conversations that don't necessarily feel good to have, but it does afterwards because I feel like, oh, I actually was authentic in this, in this uh, situation. Um, and it's interesting because my life has completely transformed since I've been more in my own frame. But what was the biggest change there? The biggest change was that I started to see myself not as the nice guy. I had to let go of that. And I had to let go of the payoffs that I got from that. And I had to reframe it. Anything we do is because there's some type of payoff. The payoff for being nice or being a people pleaser is that if I'm this way, it mitigates tension for other people. If you ask me to do something and I say no, I'm so empathic that I can feel that your disappointment is there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say yes, even though it's not authentic for me so that you don't get disappointed because I identify with your emotions and your emotions are my emotions. But you see, that's not actually true and it's not actually authentic. So the thing that I had to let go of was the payoff of feeling the sense of validation that would come from others because I was being nice or being a people pleaser. And once I started to let go of that payoff and I started to honestly have like a harsh wake up call where I realized, you know what? This isn't authentic. It is not authentic for me to say yes, the things I really don't want to do. And I went through like a, probably a three to six month period where I was actually angry at my past self. I was like angry and I was like establishing boundaries with people and in different ways. And, and it was like this resistant energy. And I had to like eventually have compassion for the past version of me that allowed that to happen. But really what this is, is it's a change in values. People that are people pleasers. Let's look at this as by the, by the way, this will change your life. What I'm about to share with you right now. Okay. It just like downloaded into my consciousness and here it goes. And I think that this will really change your perspective on a lot of things. Our sense of identity is based in values and virtues. So as a people pleaser, as a nice guy, as a nine to five job goer, there are different values there than somebody that's running their own business. That's authentic. And that isn't afraid to lay down some tension. If it, if, if, if the occasion arises, it's a different set of values. When I was working that nine to five job, what were my values? My values were being told what to do by other people. Like these are subconscious values sometimes too, by the way, if we, I had a, I valued safety. I valued comfortability. I valued that. I knew I was getting a paycheck every two weeks that I would go and be able to go on my lunch break every day and listen to YouTube videos. I valued my two weeks of vacation time. Like it's a different level of initiative that comes when you start making your own when you start taking your own initiative. So that was something that I had to become very comfortable with was, uh, was understanding and being harsh with my reality that I was being too complacent and too comfortable. And that I was attached to the safety that I got from that job. Now, one thing that didn't happen though, is I began to wake up and I began to experience a lot of pain to where the payoffs weren't paying off like they used to. The pain was I went into work and I got in trouble for saying the word belly button told if I ever said it again, I get fired immediately. There's a whole story behind that. I've shared many times before. And it's uh, it's a stupid thing that us and coworkers would do just to lighten up the mood to say belly button randomly in sentences when people's mind don't pick it up. And these customers we were helping while selling women's shoes were like really high end customers. You know, they're buying an $800 pair of shoes. So it was just fi kind of funny to do. I do it to other managers and stuff. It was fun and light. I got other people in the department to do it. I didn't get them to do it. They just decided to catch onto this bandwagon. And I created a pendulum around this idea and somebody took it too far and put in someone's email header, belly button. And guess what happened? That person sent an email to the store manager and then he brought it to the office and why did it say belly button in your, your footer? And then we all got caught in the office and, and, and it was, um, apparent someone did that and it came off a of cyber bullying or like some type of bullying when it really wasn't, it was just this fun thing. Um, everyone thought I did it because I started it, but I didn't. No one called each other. It was an interesting thing. Anyways, 
Um, I also got pulled in the office and talked down to for like 10 minutes where they were making me watch a video of me on my phone for 10 minutes in the back stock room when someone else was on the floor taking care of the floor. I mean, working in retail, there were sometimes hours with no customers. You just stand on the sales floor. You're not allowed to be on your phone on the sales floor and you'd be on the sales floor for like two hours with not one customer. You're just standing there. It's a good meditation practice. Sometimes we get bored. We take turns. One person would be on the sales floor. There's no customers. So what difference does it make? And then I would go in the back and be on my phone and then we'd take turns. Well, guess what? One time they brought me up to the office and I'm looking for 10 minutes at myself on the phone and they wanted me to watch the whole 10 minutes. So I'm sitting there in silence with them as I scroll through Instagram. You can see what I'm looking at on Instagram and I'm watching it with the store manager and the department manager and the HR lady. And it was so degrading that in that moment I decided that I am not going to work for somebody, there'll be a time in a short period of time where I'm not gonna, I will never work for somebody else again like this. I will work for myself. My values then began to change because I started to get pain. Pain helps, you know. I was talking to um, somebody recently that I know that has like this amazing, you know, a bit like this, this ability to really create amazing things with wood. And I know that this person has the potential to like do that full time to make a lot of money with it, but they're, they're learning to believe in themselves. Well, recently they said that their, their check from the government got cut. So the comfortability is no longer there of getting that check every week or two weeks. So now they have to figure it out. Well, guess what? Now they're figuring it out. That was actually a beneficial thing that their stimulus check or whatever got cut from the government because now they're figuring things out and now they're empowered to actually create and to go forth with their, and they're having opportunities come up for that carpentry and to create cool things. You know, it was a blessing that that thing happened back in 2017, 2016, 2017, because it motivated me to then go daily on YouTube to get out of that. But I had to let go of the comfort that I got of somebody else giving me a paycheck. It's a different value system. I could, my values are so concrete now, I could never work for somebody else again. Never. I know too much and I value my virtues. My value, my identity is, is around me knowing that I can create and do what I want. It's something else that's in alignment. So the reason I'm sharing this with you is because with the nice guy, it was the same thing. The nice guy, I valued other people's validation, other people's approval. And if they would give it to me, then I would feel worthy. Then I started to get a lot of pain with that. People walking on me, people not respecting what I say. And then I had to start drawing boundaries. But then what I learned how to do is I started to value within myself authenticity over everything. So when I would normally have this people pleaser mentality come out, I'd, I'd catch myself and I'd ask myself, what is authentic? You know what? It's authentic to tell this person this. It's authentic to express how I really feel. A lot of times the nice guy and the people pleasers, there's a block with being vulnerable because the idea is if I'm vulnerable with you and if I share with you what I really think and feel, you might reject me. That's why the nice guy will like date somebody and not express their true desires or their true intentions because they're afraid of that rejection. When I started to more so step into my own masculine frame to be inside my body and to like be authentic, that's when everything in my life began to change. People began to respect me more. And there is going to be when you make these shift in values virtues that you live by, you make this shift, there will be a period of time where the old people that used to treat you a certain way and used to think about you in a certain way, all of a sudden, they're like, Aaron, why are you being this new way? Just go back to the people pleaser nice guy. That's what I'm used to. You're challenging me to think differently about you and I don't like that. Well, guess what? That's their shit, not yours. You're doing your own work and that's something to remember. That's their shit. That's your stuff, not mine. And with this whole process, the thing to become aware of with this whole entire process is your sense of identity and values. And for you to attract what you really want to attract in your life, you have to let go of your own sense of identification with the life that you're currently living. So my question to you is what is your story about love? What is your story about money? What is your story about health? Because whatever that story is, it's on autopilot and it is feeding back to you exactly whatever that is. And if you wonder, what is my story? Just look around, just look around and you'll see, you'll get reflections of that. What are your relationships like? What is your relationship with your family like? What is your job situation like? Are you working a job you love or are you working a job you hate? Do you even have a job? 
You see what I mean? These are, it's, it's sometimes a harsh reality reflection, but when you start seeing, you start seeing, these are the beliefs that I have on autopilot. And if I want to create a change, it's not about changing the outside. It's about changing my story, my beliefs, my identity, my virtues, my values on the inside. You have to make a new choice. It really is just about making a new choice, but you have to let go of the safety that you got, the payoffs that you got from the old version of you. For you to attract in more love, more money, and more success, there's something that you must let go of to let that new thing in. It's like cleaning out a closet. If you're, I'm, I'm studying minimalism right now. I'm studying it. I don't know how much I'm going to bring it in my own life, but I'm going to be letting go of a lot of things that I don't really need. I do like nice, you know, I know this is, it triggers some people, but I, I, it's, I, I blame it on the Taurus in my chart. I have Taurus in my astrology. I'm very, uh, I like materialistic things. Like I like luxury. Certain things I don't really care. I mean, I do have, I guess, nice cars, but like, I was, there's this, uh, there's this car in this um, neighborhood that I live in and the neighborhood I live in, isn't like a whole bunch of like the nicest houses. I have a nice house in this neighborhood, but there's uh, some houses that look kind of like, um, they're just very old to kind of run down, but there's this one house. It's kind of run down, but in front of it, there's a Ferrari. And I remember passing it. It's like he parks it right or he or she, maybe a she parks it right in front of the driveway. That's really far from the house. So that it's like, everyone can see when they're driving on this main road and it's there every day. And I remember looking at it thinking, that's cool, but I'm not, I don't value, you know, like that kind of car. I don't, there's no reason for it. I mean, I do have a Tesla, but I value with the Tesla. I value like, you know, not having to put gas in it. That level, I like, I guess identity that comes with like feeling eco-friendly, right? There's a value. We buy cars based on our values, which is kind of funny. Like if your car is very efficient then you probably value efficiency or gas, if you have like a Prius then you probably are either environmental person or just you like the efficiency of not having to fill up so much or it's interesting, but that, that's, that's something I've noticed. But I like, I have like a nice house. I like having a nice house. I like having nice things. I like luxury. I like nice experiences. I don't feel guilty with doing that. This is just part of the human experience. It's like, you know the Dosecki guy? I imagine a, a meme with a Dosecki guy, the most interesting man in the world. It's like, I don't, I don't, you know, drink beer often, but when I do, it's Dos Equis. Well, I don't incarnate often. I know that sounds like some spiritual ego thing, but it's like we're having a 3D physical experience. So enjoy it, but be aware of your own values. And I value nice houses, so I have a nice house, but I'm learning to let go of things that don't serve. Now, back to the analogy of the whole, imagine you have this closet that's so damn full, you don't have room for anything new. So the key to this is being aware of what can you let go of to allow something new in. So many people are like, I want to attract in love. I want to attract in love. I need to think about it. And I need to feel it. And I need to like put things in twos because if things are in twos and subconsciously I'm priming myself for the feng shui of like love and all this stuff. What if you just focus on letting go of the beliefs you're unworthy, letting go of the rejection wound that you might have from childhood, letting go of believing that you're single and that's all you're worthy of. Uh, letting go of a past relationship, letting go of attachment, letting go of a label that says I'm single. If you'd focus on just the letting go, that stuff would come in, but you have to let go before it comes in. So the message for today is that letting go is the secret and the key to letting in. It works like magic too. When you let go of outcome, magic can happen, but you have to let go and you have to make the choice to let go. And the choice and letting go is really, really easy. We only believe it's hard and therefore we believe it's hard. So therefore it is hard. One sec. I need to basically the cameras that I have, they only have 30 minutes, like 30 minute thing where I have to reset them after 30 minutes. And these podcasts go longer than 30 minutes. What was I talking about? So in general, for letting go, realize you must let go to then let in and the it, things work like magic when you begin to let go. The more, like I, I, I noticed that if I'm attached to the outcome to how YouTube videos do, to how people respond to them, are you guys liking this video? If you guys like this video, can you please like it? Then what happens is you feel that needy energy and it blocks the actual results from coming. But when I let go of the outcome and I don't care whether you like it or not, then there's more freedom in there, right? I was telling my girlfriend yesterday, like when people want me to do something, I normally will have this resistance to doing it. It's just the rebel in me. It's probably because of my ex-stepmom stuff. I don't know. 
But when I'm allowed to make the choice on my own, I'm much more willing to do it. It's much easier because there's less resistance. So when you let go, you then naturally will start to let in. When I've let go of outcome of YouTube videos doing well, guess what happened? It's like YouTube videos do much better. Uh, people resonate with them more because there's less attached energy. Now, letting go is easy. The only reason we believe it's hard is because we've learned that. We believe that there's a lot of safety with our attachments. If you'd stop believing though that letting go is hard, it would be easy. Letting go is simply a choice. It's a choice we make with trust in the universe that things will work out better for us if we let go. When I've let go of outcome of things, I can't tell you how much times magic happens. What if there was one secret that is the key to you manifesting your dream life, to you shifting into a new version of yourself to bring in more love, more joy, more success, more abundance than ever before. When I look, and I recently did this, I went through all of not only my past videos, but I was going through and looking through what is the thing that changed my life the most over the last three to four years. Because in three to four years, there's a huge difference in contrast between the person that I was back in 2017, working a nine to five job selling women's shoes, to the person that I am now. The vibrational difference is very dramatic. <laughs> it's completely different. One, I felt like I had no choice. I felt like I had to go to a job I wasn't passionate about. I was living at my dad's house. And then the other one, which is right now, I am living my dream life, doing what I love, living in more abundance than I ever thought possible. And it's something that I can clearly see that it was one thing that made all the difference in the world. And just inside of everything I'm going through in my life right now too, I'm going through a process of subtracting. I am subtracting things from my life that are taking me either off my path or that do not contribute towards my own manifestation or my goals or whatever it is. And the one thing that I want to share with you that will also help you make your manifestation so much easier is understanding that really this comes down to one thing. And now you're thinking to yourself, Aaron, okay, <laughs> I get it. Just tell me the one thing. What is the one thing? The one thing is literally the one thing. It is the one thing. The one thing is the key to manifesting your dream reality. Now you might say, Aaron, what do you mean by this? <laughs> it sounds like you're talking in cryptic code right now. So the one thing is I've realized that it has been one main thing area of focus that has gained momentum that has then allowed me to create a bridge from the reality that I'm in to the reality that I desire to be in. So back in 2017, I learned or I started to make daily videos on YouTube. It was one thing. I focused on one thing, which then began to develop momentum. And that one thing, by the way, also changed my sense of identity. Remember, we don't always get in life that which we want because what we want, we lack. If we want it, we're saying we don't have it, but we always get in life a reflection of who we are. Our reality is a reflection of who we are being. Now, the interesting thing is that our identity is completely flexible. We've decided at a certain point in our past that I am this X, Y, Z type of way. When I was in high school, before sophomore year in high school, I literally thought that I was not smart. I thought that I was dumb. And because of that, guess what my average grade point was? I got a C or a D in most classes. At one moment, it was literally a moment, I was in an English class and the teacher gave back some test results and I scored higher than all the other kids. And she told me this, she's like, you actually did really well. I got like a, a 92 or something. She's like, most everybody else got like a C. All of a sudden I started to think of myself as smart. From that point going forward, school was easy. I became quote unquote smart. All that happened was my identity shifted. And it's funny, you know, sometimes when I, when I talk about these things that shift identity, um, I think that there's certain also patterns that maybe our parents went through 
that we tend to go through at similar phases of our own life sometimes when the, when the energy is unconscious. I know that when I was 29, when my dad was 29 years old, he went full-time as a firefighter. That was his passion. Before that, he was working at Circus Circus in Vegas, making like 15 bucks an hour, which back in the 90s was like making like 30, 40 bucks an hour now. And the funny thing is after I was in you know high school and college, I went to, uh, I worked at Barney's New York selling women's shoes and before that Nordstrom selling women's shoes. I got paid good money, you know, like 30 bucks an hour nowadays uh, to do that, even though I wasn't passionate about it. But then at 29 years old, I went full-time on YouTube. So that was an interesting thing. And I remember telling my dad about this identity shifting thing and, or this, this thing when I just realized I was smart in sophomore year of high school. And he said the same thing happened to him, although for my dad, it was the chemistry class. And actually what happened was he gave the, the teacher asked what the answer was to a certain problem. Everyone is figuring out. And he, like he, the teacher asked for everyone to raise their hand if they got a certain answer. And my dad didn't raise his hand and my dad raised his hand and gave his answer. And it turned out his answer was the right answer. And everyone else in the class got the wrong answer. <laughs> in that moment, he realized that speaking up for himself was like something that was powerful, but also that he was smart. So it was like the same thing in a way. But identity shifting is really the key to transformation. But there's one thing that if you do will completely transform your identity and your life. This is why I also recommend to people, like if you do one thing consistently for like 21 days, it will transform the way you view yourself. If there's one thing that also changed my life more than anything, it's learning to meditate, which isn't something you really even learn to do. I started meditating back in 2012 and within literally weeks to a couple months, my whole entire life transformed. And when I started to do it, you want to know what else changed about me? My identity. I started to see myself as a Zen dude. Like before that I had ADHD. It was very hard for me to focus. I was taking Adderall in the day and at nighttime, I was smoking cannabis. That was my only, those are the two things that I felt like I needed. I was working at Nordstrom's and women's shoes. And then I learned meditation within two or three weeks. I was able to get off Adderall within a month. I was able to quit smoking cannabis and it completely transformed my life. But I was in a way, I also want to know what made it so hard for me to let go of smoking cannabis, the identity, the identity of me being the person that smoked. And also having friends as well that were in the same clique as me. We all smoked. You know, everyone would come to my house. I had this like a house kind of in the middle of nowhere in Las Vegas, kind of outside the city a little bit. And I had like a, a, a light in the back, in, in the backyard with like this big concrete patch with a basketball like hoop. And we'd play basketball till like one or two in the morning. And we'd just smoke, listen to music. It was like two years of my life. That's what I did. So for me to let go of that was kind of scary because I was like letting go of my friend circle. I was uh, like realizing I might become more and more unrelatable. And I just started studying like esoteric stuff and I started watching YouTube videos and I, I, I became so fascinated with like spirituality and it completely shifted my identity. But meditation, meditation allows you that little, that little space in between your thoughts and reacting to the thoughts to where then you can like, you can let go of the momentum of the old identity. Because in that moment too, I began letting go of the identity around the pain of my past with my ex stepmom. I let go of the identity around, eventually, this is years later, I realized that I had identity that was very strongly gripped to having and being a part of a nine to five job I wasn't passionate about. But awareness is the key to transformation. So awareness, becoming aware of your thoughts and realizing you are not your thoughts. Most people identify with their thoughts. And then from there, being able to take action to be a new version of you. You can make that choice at any moment. You do not have to wait for somebody to give you permission to be your most authentic self. My buddy Victor and I, we coach people on helping people go full-time doing what they love. We help people learn how to grow like an online business how to grow uh, social media following. Most of these people are like life coaches and like healers and astrologers and like people in the spiritual niche. But one of the biggest blocks that they have is they believe that they're not credible. They say, I'm not credible. They're waiting for someone to give them either a college degree. They're waiting for someone to give them some type of coaching certificate. 
And Victor and I both, we didn't, nobody told us, you have now done this and you can now deem yourself worthy of making YouTube videos. Instead, just start, you, you give yourself permission to be that new identity, that version of you you prefer to be. And I did have blocks come up, by the way, when I started making videos in 2017, which is the one thing that shifted my reality from being in that nine to five job to me doing what I love full time. It's the one thing was making videos. But as I started to make videos, I started to wonder, do people even, are they going to be even interested in what I have to say? Is what I have to say even valuable? Is it credible? I felt, uh, I had lots of reasons, I guess, to feel blocked, looking into the new identity, especially. I remember my sisters were making fun of me, like, are you going to go make videos for your seven subscribers? Because literally on YouTube, I had seven subscribers. And my sisters are like, oh, go, uh, go make your videos for your set. That's what you're going to go do. And then also they were, their, their mom is my ex stepmom, And they were being, they were joking around. They weren't, they didn't mean that meanly. They're just giving me shit because they're my younger sisters, but their mom, which is my ex stepmom, was, I would hear stories about how she was making fun of me for my sisters. She'd go in front of like, she'd go, mom, you're going to expand your conscience. And she would like do what I, you know, what I've been doing in my videos for a while. And I would hear these stories and I'm like, oh, like I'd feel maybe I'm not this kind of person. Maybe I should be embarrassed, but I stuck to the identity. I committed to that version of me and I didn't let someone else's perception or someone else's perspective halter my success or my, my commitment to that identity. You see, these blocks are going to come up, but the key to this is to start with your one thing right now. Do not wait. I waited for like two years. Now I'm telling you, don't wait because if I would have started even two years before that, who knows what would have happened. If I kept waiting, I wouldn't be here today making videos and you might not even know who I am <laughs> or what my teachings are or whatever. So the one thing that you do that you commit to is going to change your sense of identity, which is then going to change your reality. This is why a lot of times I, I don't get triggered with this, but the law of attraction teachings that I see now a lot of times are like, think better thoughts. You know, thoughts stem from belief and feeling. That's where thought, thoughts are not the initial thing. And that's why meditation also helps you to not identify with the thoughts, to more so observe them. But realize that who are you? Who do you believe you are? That commitment to that version of you, in that version of you, there's normally one activity that you can do that will change your life more than anything else. And you start to set that intention to what that is. Now, some of you may say, Aaron, I don't know what my one thing is. How did you know your one thing was making YouTube videos? This is what I recommend. Try different things and let yourself intuitively get the message like downloaded in a way. I know it sounds kind of esoteric, but in 2017, I was working that nine to five job. I was walking. Many of you know the story, but I was walking from my bathroom or I was walking from my room at my dad's house to the bathroom. And I just had this download that if I were to make videos every single day for a year, my life would transform. So that was, I took that down. I took that idea. I connected to my higher self. That was the download I got. And that's what I did. My life within three months completely transformed within six months, even more so because I put my two weeks in at that nine to five job. I wasn't passionate about that shifted my identity once I went full time. And then guess what happened? I was like, okay, I need to learn how to make abundance with YouTube. Is it just ads? I realized there's a whole other side of the business besides just YouTube ads. Most people ask, oh, how do you make money on YouTube? Is it just, yeah, Google AdSense is a, is a, is a portion of it, but the main part of it comes from having some type, it's called internet marketing, having some form of digital courses, some programs, group coaching, these different things. And what I learned though, was, um, I talked to somebody, it was an identity shift for me. Now there's this new thing I want to talk about. I don't know what we're going to call this yet, but anytime you see somebody else, if you want to download like a blueprint of a new identity or a way of being, you can look and start doing research to find other people that are that way. And when you see somebody else that does it, it increases the belief that you can do it too. So for me, it was the, uh, it was going full-time on YouTube. I started to see other creators 
that were doing well on YouTube. I'm like, oh, I could too. I have my own unique perspective. I remember I was watching back in the day, back in 2012, watching Ralph Smart's videos. And I'm like, oh, he has got unique perspectives, but I have a different perspective on this topic. So I would then realize, why don't I share my ideas? And then at first, by the way, it was cringy. I was not good at talking. I had like a script that was taped to my, to my window that I was reading off of. But the reason I tell you this is because you get good through action. That's how it works. You get good by taking action and by being it consistently. Whereas if you just do it one time over, you know, the course of like three months, it's, it's like you'll only get so much reference experience, but the more you do anything, the better you get. Now, the identity shift, the second identity shift that I had, the time that one thing that changed is I met somebody, I was making like a couple grand a month on YouTube, barely enough to get by. I was making less than I was at Barney's New York actually, but I worked for myself and that felt so good. What happened is I met somebody else, I talked to somebody else online that had way less YouTube subscribers than me, but had and told me that they were making like 20, 30 K a month. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, there's something this person knows that I don't know. So what I did is I got a couple book recommendations from this person. I started to learn marketing and I spent literally months and months and months learning marketing, learning how to grow an email list, learning how to create digital courses, learning how to launch things, how to develop a better relationship with customers. I, I began and committed to learning this whole process. And within months, not, not even months, within, yeah, within a month or two, I'd say, I went from making like 3,000 a month to making like 10, 15, 20,000 a month. And from there, it just continued to grow. And it's because I've learned things that before I just never knew or valued. I was like, no, I'm spiritual. I just focus on the content. I'm like more artistic than, than like focus on the business side of things. But guess what? When I started learning internet marketing, I started to see myself as an entrepreneur. There's another identity shift. That became a big area of focus for me for like a year or two. I just studied internet marketing, changed my whole life. And now luckily from learning that I've learned how to like make this abundance in such a short period of time that my buddy Victor and I were able to coach people on how to go full time doing what they love in a much shorter period of time than usual. But what would have probably taken me like what took me six months would have taken me like literally three weeks if I would have known what I do now because you don't need actually a big YouTube following or Instagram following or social media following to go full time. You just need the right strategy and you need to be putting out value. But if you guys want to learn more about that, go to fulltimepurpose.com, fulltimepurpose.com and you can check out more of that. But my identity shifted. But now where I'm at right now in my business and in life in general is I'm learning how to subtract things from my life. I'm realizing that there's my life becomes so complex and has become very complex. Like because of the abundance, and this happens a lot. I remember watching people like uh, Jake Paul, Logan Paul, like vloggers. I used to go on my lunch break every day, you know, working at, at uh, Barney's New York, and I would watch different YouTubers and their vlogs. And I realized that when I got habitually watching somebody, I'd get like, I'd watch their content consistently. And I remember what happened with some of these bigger creators. What happens, they become so successful that their energy goes away from what got them to be that big, like their own level of relatability. And all of a sudden they start focusing more on the money. They start focusing on like brand deals and all this stuff. And it takes away from the authenticity. And then they lose kind of that, that momentum that they had. But also they're just trying to do like 80 different things. Like Logan Paul that was doing YouTube, he killed it on YouTube when he was just doing YouTube. Then what he did is he's now just focused on his podcast. And now his podcast is doing well. It takes one thing to really like focus and to get that momentum growth. I remember recently I, I met a good buddy of mine. His name's uh, Lewis Howes. Many of you may know his podcast, School of Greatness podcast. And um, he's got a huge podcast. He came to Sedona with his girlfriend, him and I hung out. And I remember we were talking about business stuff. And I thought that what he was going to tell me to do was like, I was like, you know, I should be focusing more on my podcast. Like I have this YouTube channel that I had from years ago. And then I have this podcast and what he told me was, um, he gave me interesting business advice and he knows what he's doing. I mean, he's been doing this a lot longer than I have, but basically he didn't tell me to go all in on podcasts. He said, dude, you should go back to YouTube. That's where you started out. That's where the momentum is. 
And it just takes so much momentum to grow your podcast. Like you gotta be doing podcasts so consistently to get momentum on podcasts. He's like, I would focus all the energy back on YouTube. And YouTube is like the one thing that you focus on. You'll do really good with that. And I was thinking to myself, wow, there's a lot of truth in that. Like I was kind of not getting bored. I have gotten a little bit bored with YouTube. And then I was like, oh, I should do more podcasts. And maybe if I, I, I it's almost like shiny object sy syndrome. But then I start focusing on all these other things. And as my business has got bigger, as my life has got more, as I become more successful, my life has become more complex. I had a house in Vegas, or I was renting a house in Vegas. Then I bought a house in Sedona. And then from Sedona, I then moved to Austin. I bought a house in Austin. Then that Austin house I'm renting out now because it's in the middle of the city and I wanted to be more in nature. And now I'm more in nature. I've got like three houses now. I'm renting out two of them, but it's like, not, so I'm not trying to say that to brag or you for you to think that I'm really cool or anything. I'm saying I was actually got pretty complex to find tenants. I had this, you know, uh, I have an assistant that like does and manages all this for me, but now I've got more people on salary. Things get complex the more you grow. Whereas back in the day, it was just me and the freaking camera. It was just me and you. That's it. Me and you, me talking to the camera. It was so simple. Now there's like payroll. There's like all this other stuff going on. And as the business grows, it'll, it'll continue that to happen, especially when you move into live events soon. But what I'm doing now is I'm actually subtracting back things to a simpler way of being. So you know, what, do, what are my real values? What do I really wanna focus on? And what I realize I do wanna focus on is live events. So I need to find, I'm finding ways of doing that, whether it's live events on YouTube live and then eventually in person. That's what I realize I wanna do. That's gonna be my new one thing. But there's fear in letting go of the old, just me making YouTube videos like the way I've used to done it. Even though I'll still be making videos technically, there's a fear with that old identity being let go of. Because if I let go of that old identity that always has to work hard, then maybe I'll lose everything I've already built. I remember as I was making daily videos on YouTube, like nine months after, uh, four, five months after I was full-time on YouTube, and even actually a year after I was full-time on YouTube, I went to Costa Rica to a life transformation spa and I was doing plant medicine like ceremonies four nights in a row, a place that's legal that you could do it. And I was doing it. And I remember on the third day, like I felt this incredible pressure to make videos and I'm going through this like deep transformative emotional experience. And I feel this, like where this guilt coming from? Why do I always feel like I need to be doing something? And this last month on YouTube, on, on business in general, I've really taken a step back. And I used to always, I go, I have to make more money. I have to do this. I have to do that. I'm like, no, you know what? I'm going to take a, a month to just chill and get clear. And if you don't know what that clear, clarity is for you with your identity, maybe just take a little bit of time to sit and meditate and to be more present. And maybe the answer then you'll make space for it to what your one thing can be. But what I'm realizing is I need to focus my energy more on one thing, on one product. It's funny in my business, I have like nine, 10 different products different courses. And I'm like, why don't I just focus on one, one that really helps get people results. Just one, that's it. And I have this new course coming out. That's going to be on manifestation. Let me push this thing in here. I have these cameras that have this thing where, um, they turn off after 25, 30 minutes, <laughs> but in general, the one piece of advice I have for you today is for you to create your dream reality. It's going to take focus. And there's going to be certain actions you do that leverage your life more than others. When I was making daily videos on YouTube, that leveraged me into a new version of me. It changed my sense of identity. When I began to meditate, I started to see myself as a meditator. It changed my sense of awareness. And there's one thing that if you committed to would change your life more than anything. And it all it requires you to do is to choose it and to commit to it. And if that means choosing and committing to figure out what this is, then that's cool too to figure out what is your one thing. But there's one thing that if you do will change your life more over the next year or two than you can even imagine. I've used this analogy before, but if you were to, uh, like th there is also a book called the one thing that talks about like simplifying or, you know, simplifying and, and focusing on the one thing. But it, one of the analogies it uses is like, if you were to have a, if you were to just simply stop drinking soda, with your lunch and said drink water. One day, did it make a big difference? No, not really, just one soda, right? Even though it is like corn syrup and sugar. But over the course of a week, two weeks, six weeks, six months, a year, that becomes hundreds and hundreds of pounds of corn syrup over time. 
That becomes thousands and thousands of milligrams of sugar. That becomes, that, that affects your insulin, your blood spike, how much your, your sugar's in, in blood spikes, so that then you're even more hungry. It affects so many different areas of your life just by switching out water. And one thing that I've realized in my own life is just the, how you do one thing is really how you do everything. How you do one thing is how you do everything. I focused on the YouTube videos that changed everything. I've realized that, you know, it's funny. Anytime I go through, I'm going through like a little bit of a weight cut right now. I'm actually trying to gain muscle and, and lose a little bit of fat. So I'm going through this process right now with my body where I'm becoming very aware of like how I'm pushing myself. My whole body's sore because I've been doing better workouts at the gym. But guess what? Anytime I go through this in my health, I also do it in my business. Right now, I'm trimming the fat in my business. I'm literally trimming the fat of like all these things I used to do that I no longer have to do. I'm taking out actions that don't really serve me. Checking Instagram 20 times a day doesn't really serve me and I don't need to justify it by I am a social media person. Like I'm realizing that the more I can let go of these things and focus on one thing, the more my life will transform and the more simple it becomes, the more I can let go of all this other stuff. If I can just focus on like one product, one like, customer experience, right? Like helping people get a certain result. And I just focused on that. Then everything in my life, I believe would change. So this is something that I think will change your life. If you commit to focus on letting go of what doesn't serve, letting go. What is one thing you could let go of? And what is one thing you can wire in that will help create an identity shift for you. The magic of somebody, when you go to a Bikram yoga class, there's a reason they tell you by the first or second day that you have to come for a week to really get the benefits. Is that true that you really need a week to get the benefits of Bikram yoga? Maybe, maybe not, but guess what actually happens in that week that you are doing the Bikram yoga? You then may find, you know what? I'm renting someone else's sweaty mat. So you know what I'm gonna do instead? I'm gonna go buy my own mat. Now you've made a purchase and you're like, you know what? I bought the mat. Now I'm going to go to Lululemon and spend like $180,000 on a pair of, uh, on a pair of leggings. Okay. Now that you've done that, now you start to see yourself as a yoga person, your identity begins to shift. And then after 21 days of doing this, guess what? It's easy for you to make it to go to the yoga class because it's a part of your identity. You create a dead shift. Then you have that yoga membership and then you're stuck. You're, you're not stuck, but it's actually a good positive thing to be aware of. But the magic of this is not what you do one day, not what you do two days, but what you do repetitively becomes your identity. This video right here, this is one of the most powerful videos that I made. And I highly recommend that you watch it because it'll help you with what you learned in this video. What happens when somebody's looking to manifest is they may be thinking positive, but feeling negative. They may be thinking, oh my God, this is gonna change my life.